On Saturday, February 13, 1886, in New York City, the body of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock traveled to Norristown, Pennsylvania, his native state, and was laid to rest there. Everywhere the general's remains traveled, a crowd formed to view the famed warrior of the American Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant wrote in his memoirs that Hancock stands the most conspicuous figure of all the general officers who did not exercise a separate command. He commanded a corps longer than any other, and his name was never mentioned as having committed in battle a blunder for which he was responsible. His genial disposition made him friends, and his personal courage and his presence with his command in the thickest of the fight won for him the confidence of troops serving under him. No matter how hard the fight, the Second Corps always felt that their commander was looking after them. Hancock's life started simple enough. He and his identical twin brother Hillary were born on February 14, 1824 in the hamlet of Montgomery Square in Pennsylvania. Winfield Scott Hancock was named after the hero of the War of 1812, General Winfield Scott. His ancestry was made up of English, Scottish, and Welsh immigrants to the United States and had settled in Pennsylvania because of the good economic opportunities that the region had to offer. His mother and father, Elizabeth and Benjamin Hancock, moved their little family to Norristown where Benjamin taught school and studied for the bar while his wife, Elizabeth, helped him make and sell ladies' hats in a store. The couple struggled for some years while Benjamin established himself as a lawyer. Winfield's father was a deacon in the local Baptist church and a strong Democrat. Hancock's biographer stated, Winfield, the lawyer's son, had instilled in him from an early age respect and reverence for the law, for the concept of due process, for the Almighty, and for the principles and tenets of the Democratic Party as they matured in the age of Jackson and Van Buren. As expected for identical twins, Winfield and Hillary were inseparable, and indistinguishable in their early years. Their father was on the board of trustees for the Norristown Academy, and so the boys attended school there. But when Pennsylvania implemented its public school system, the boys were enrolled in it. Their father would sit in on the school board for 30 years. Winfield got into an expected amount of trouble as a young man, but did well in his studies. His mother and father made sure that he attended Sunday school every week as well. He became such a well-known young man with an excellent reputation that he was chosen to read the Declaration of Independence for the town celebration in 1839. Some stories were relayed years later that Winfield had gotten together a group of young men from Norristown and had formed them up into marching columns and battle lines, and it was this military bent that signaled to others that Winfield wanted to pursue a career in the army. His father was hesitant for his son to go that route, but one of Benjamin's colleagues in the law profession wanted to write the Secretary of War to advocate for the young man's appointment to the United States Military Academy. Benjamin relented, and the congressman in his district selected Winfield to attend West Point. At the age of 16, Hancock entered the academy. In the summer of 1840, Winfield Scott Hancock passed his entrance exam and was officially admitted into West Point. As all first-year freshmen did, he spent July and August in an encampment to simulate military life. He was thrilled when President Martin Van Buren, a fellow Democrat, came to visit the young cadets that summer. Another visitor that Winfield was excited to meet was General Winfield Scott himself, his namesake. Scott would visit the summer encampment and gather the young men around him and tell them war stories, which the young men were eager to hear. The old general met with the young man and was pleased with his promise as a future military leader. Although Winfield was not a troublesome student, he found that one could rack up demerits very easily. 200 demerits would get a cadet sent home, but Hancock was careful to never receive more than 140 in a single year. The superintendent of West Point was Major Richard Delafield, called Dicky the Punster behind his back. He won good graces with the cadets Winfield's first year when he introduced a new style of pantaloons with buttons in the front rather than the side. The cadets became acquainted with the superintendent and his two adjutants, Lieutenant Irvin McDowell and Lieutenant Joseph Hooker. Hancock's class of 1844 was not the most illustrious class of cadets. Out of the 54 who started out, only 25 graduated, and of those 25, only 5 served in the Union Army and 3 served in the Confederate Army. Of those who served in either army, only a few were notable. Alfred Pleasanton led Federal Cavalry for the Army of the Potomac. Alexander Hayes commanded a brigade and a division under Hancock, and Simon Bolivar Buckner worked his way up the Confederate ranks to become a very prominent general. Although his class was not as famous as others, he was surrounded by future leaders in classes behind and in front of him, including Ulysses S. Grant, James Longstreet, 
George McClellan, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Fitz John Porter, and Edmund Kirby Smith. Hancock graduated 18th out of 25. His grades were not spectacular, and in fact, were very mediocre. The class of 1844 were then sent off to different commands. However, Hancock's low score landed him in the infantry, the 6th Infantry Regiment to be more specific. Hancock was stationed with the 6th Infantry in the Indian Territory, first at Fort Tosin on the Red River, then to Fort Washita on the Washita River. During this time, in what was called the Permanent Indian Frontier, relations between whites and Native Americans were comparatively calm, mainly because there was no large influx of migrants traveling through that region that would have created friction and thus caused conflict to emerge. As a young officer and brevet lieutenant, Hancock set about performing the duties of his rank, getting to know the ins and outs of army life. One of the main duties was being in charge of recruitment. His excellent ability at recruiting caused him some problems when the Mexican-American War broke out in 1846. Although in September of that year he received his commission as a regular second lieutenant, he had become valuable to the War Department as a recruiter, so he was put in charge of a group of young recruits destined for Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis from Cincinnati, Ohio. Once he arrived in St. Louis, he was ordered to Fort Scott, Missouri to the unhappiness of his superior in Cincinnati who saw him as an invaluable recruiter. He was sent back to the Newport Barracks on the Kentucky side of the Ohio River across from Cincinnati. Wanting to be involved in the war, he set about trying to find a way to be transferred to the front lines. He wrote to his brother Hillary on May 5, 1847, stating, The only thing that grieves me is that I cannot get to Mexico. I made an application today to join the army going to the front, but he thought it was doubtful. He had a lot of responsibilities in Newport Barracks, as the superintendent of recruiting services for the Western Division and as assistant inspector general, but he longed to be where the action was. He wrote to the colonel of the barracks and to the adjutant general to be sent to Mexico. Finally, on May 31, 1847, Hancock was ordered to conduct a body of recruits to Mexico and rejoin the 6th Infantry. It took nearly a month before he set out for his journey down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi, and to New Orleans. There he boarded a ship destined for Veracruz, the amphibious landing location for General Scott's army. By the time Hancock made it to Veracruz, Scott's army had pushed a couple hundred miles inland all the way to Puebla, Mexico, the nation's second city with around 80,000 people. Scott waited there for reinforcements. Hancock left the port city the day after arriving with a contingent of 2,500 men under General Franklin Pierce. Hancock, along with the reinforcements, traveled the hundreds of miles toward Puebla, being fired upon by guerrillas along the way. It was a brutal march, but the contingent arrived in Puebla on August 6th, bringing Scott's army to a little more than 10,000 men. The very next day, Scott moved out his army toward the capital city. Hancock and the 6th Infantry Regiment were in Brigadier General William J. Worth's division, and they moved out two days later, giving many of the men who had traveled hundreds of miles a rest before proceeding inland. General Scott attacked Mexico City from the south in an unexpected movement, and it was the 6th Infantry in Colonel Newman S. Clark's brigade that moved through the lava fields and pushed the enemy to the fortified convent at Cherubusco. They made several charges against the position before carrying it. Hancock sustained a minor wound that he didn't even notice in the thick of the fight. The baptism by fire experienced by Hancock was a pleasant experience for the young man. He thoroughly enjoyed combat. He would receive a brevet promotion to first lieutenant for gallant and meritorious conduct at Cherubusco. After a short armistice, Scott resumed his assault against Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana's army. Worth's men fought around two hours involving fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The brigade lost half of its officers and one-third of its men, which placed Hancock in command of his company. The final push against Chapultepec was made on September 13th, but Hancock was lying in his tent, sick with chills and a fever. However, once he heard the sound of battle, he emerged from his tent. Wrapping my blanket around me, he wrote, I crept to the top of the roof of the nearest house and watched the fight, and had strength enough to cheer with the boys when the castle fell. By the time Scott's army marched into Mexico City, Hancock was back in the ranks. With the capital captured, the army stayed in the city for nine more months as negotiations transpired. While the army settled into their new location, friendships emerged as each man 
had more time on their hands. He quickly made friends with the new commander of his company, First Lieutenant Lewis Armistead, and the other officers of his regiment, including Lieutenant Edward Johnson and Simon Bolivar Buckner. A new second lieutenant joined the regiment, a Virginian named Henry Heath. Armistead, Hancock, and Heath were messmates, and as Heath stated, never was a mess happier than ours. Heath and Hancock became close friends, especially when Heath found out that the ladies of Mexico were infatuated with Hancock. Heath, to gain attention from the ladies, stuck close to the side of his messmate. Heath stated, Hancock was then a magnificent specimen of youthful beauty, as he afterwards was of manly looks. He was tall, graceful, a blonde with light hair, the style of all others that at once captivated the Mexican girls. Heath admitted, I owed my invitations to Hancock with whom these senoritas were in love. After a few months of being in the capital, Clark and his men were ordered to the south to help collect taxes. There, at a large plantation, Hancock, Clark, Heath, and the regimental adjutant were invited to eat dinner. Heath and Hancock spied the beautiful daughter of the plantation owner, and during a walk through the garden, spied her again. Now is your chance, old fellow, Heath said. Pluck a rose and go for her. I will remain here, gather flowers, and watch. If her duenna comes, I will be seized with a coughing spell. You must do a heap of lovemaking in a short time, for you may never have such a chance again. Hancock then set off with the flower in hand. When I took her hand, Hancock explained, I squeezed it just a little and she returned it. Then he found out that she was going to be traveling to England to finish her schooling and attempted to convince her to come to the United States to finish her schooling and they would be married. When Heath's back was turned, he kissed her and told her he had never loved before. Hancock came back to Heath. He relayed the story to the Virginian and Heath replied, how could you have told such a story? I know you have said the same thing to half a dozen girls in the city of Mexico and God knows how many in the States. Hancock replied, We are at war with Mexico. Peace has not yet been made. And you know, all is fair in love and war. When the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, the U.S. Army moved to the coast to board transports, and it is there that Hancock got into trouble. He was now the official regimental quartermaster for his regiment, and the 6th Infantry was ordered to move toward the port to start embarking. But the 2nd Dragoons had mixed up multiple buckets of juleps for the 6th Infantry to drink as they passed by. Some soldiers imbibed more than others, and Hancock's quartermaster wagons were snarled in a traffic jam. The new lieutenant colonel of the regiment, Gustavus Loomis, exclaimed where everyone could hear, This is all Hancock's fault. If he had attended to his duty, this blockage would not have occurred. He has shamefully neglected his duty. A drunk Hancock confronted Loomis in the commander's tent where he was reading his Bible. Winfield sweared at Loomis, taking issue with Loomis's claims that he had neglected his duty. The lieutenant colonel ordered him back to his own tent and under arrest. Heath escorted Hancock back to his tent and put him to bed. The young Pennsylvanian awoke and was told of what he had done, which mortified him so much that he apologized for his actions and words. Hancock's courageous service was not dampened by the incident and he went along with his regiment to New Orleans. The 6th Infantry made it safely to New Orleans, then steamed up the Mississippi River to Jefferson Barracks, where it was joined by the 7th and 8th Infantry Regiments. All of the men and officers knew that their unified commands would soon disperse. As Hancock's biographer stated, everyone knew that in a very short time the regiments would be split up and scattered over the western frontier, their brief existence as actual units ended except on paper in the War Department. A company here, a company there, and the thrill of fighting a real war would fade, leaving only memories of the battles with Santa Ana's force. In the meantime, however, each of the regiments gave a ball for its officers and the ladies of St. Louis. A final fling before the deadening routine of the peacetime army fastened its grip again. As the regimental quartermaster, Hancock was responsible for getting all the supplies ready to throw the party, so he and Henry Heath would make several trips into St. Louis to gather all the necessary equipment. Heath, however, found a St. Louis beauty on one of his trips, and had to find ways to see her without Hancock because, as Heath said, I knew if Hancock accompanied me, my cake would be all dough. She would never look at me. After the festivities, Heath convinced the commander of the barracks to let the band and officers parade around the city of St. Louis and serenade the young ladies. They spent the better part of an evening doing this, 
and as they were about to head back to Jefferson Barracks, a local who had been walking with the group exclaimed that the most beautiful girl in the West had just returned from her trip in the East and that she needed to be serenaded. The group then headed to the young lady's home where they played some tunes for her. Her window shutter opened slightly and something white was thrown out. It was a white glove. It was given to Hancock. Her name was Almira Russell. There was no time for romance in Hancock's life at this point. The 6th Infantry was split up and Hancock's group went to Fort Crawford in Wisconsin while Heath's group went to Fort Atkinson in Iowa. The two friends were only separated for a short while until Heath came down with a serious case of dysentery, which he had contracted in Mexico. The Virginian was sent to Fort Crawford where the medical facilities were better equipped to take care of him, but the doctors soon pronounced the young man's life nearly at an end and they sent him to Richmond to die. Since he was too weak to travel by himself, Hancock volunteered to accompany him home. As they traveled by steamer down the Mississippi River, then up the Ohio, by the time they reached Cincinnati, Heath's condition had improved greatly. They stopped over in that city where Hancock took care of some business. A young lady had expected marriage, and Hancock had to straighten out the situation. They came to an agreement that they would be lifelong friends, but nothing more. Hancock and Heath went to Cleveland then, where Heath had another setback. Hancock nursed his friend back to traveling ability, and the two set off for New York City. On May 10th, 1849, they went to the Astor Opera House. A riot erupted outside the theater where 22 people were killed. However, the two young soldiers were unharmed. After the harrowing escape, they decided to pay General Scott a visit. The two officers were invited to dinner with the general, where they had shad and potatoes. Scott bragged about the taters that he got from a friend who grew them in New Jersey. When the plates were set down in front of Hancock and Heath, Winfield took his fork and began mashing his taters. Scott was aghast. He exclaimed, My God, my young friend, do you mash your potatoes? You can't tell the taste of potato when it's mashed. Hancock replied, I like my potatoes mashed. The witty Heath watched how Scott ate his potatoes and imitated the old general, then said, Yes, general, I can't tell the taste of potato when it's mashed. Hancock glared at the Virginian. When the two left the general's quarters, Hancock berated his friend, and Heath laughed until he nearly cried. For the rest of his life, Heath never failed to tell the potato story on Hancock. The two messmates then traveled to Philadelphia, then to Washington, D.C., where the two split up. Heath going on to Richmond, feeling much better, and Hancock heading back to Fort Crawford. By the end of the year, regimental headquarters was placed back at St. Louis, so Hancock was able to visit the young lady who had thrown her glove from the window. It was Major General Don Carlos Buell who introduced the two. Almira was the blonde-haired daughter of Samuel Russell, a prominent merchant in St. Louis. Winfield wasted no time in wooing Almira. By January 1850, the two were married, with Buell, Orlando Wilcox, and Anderson D. Nelson being the groomsmen for Hancock. A St. Louis resident described Almira as such, a woman of fine physique and striking comeliness of face, an accomplished musician, sparkling conversation, read the gems of repartee, and bounteously endowed with a kind and generous nature. She was universally admired and beloved. By October 1850, the two saw the birth of their first child, a boy named Russell. The couple and their child moved to Jefferson Barracks, but found their quarters dilapidated, with no hinges or keys for the doors. Hancock reached out to the post commander, Braxton Bragg, to help with the situation, but Bragg informed Winfield that a major had occupied the residence previous to him, and if it was good enough for a major, it was good enough for a lieutenant. The two began a heated exchange of letters until General Clark stepped in and had the place fixed for the couple. As regimental quartermaster, Hancock languished as a stagnant lieutenant. He was excellent at his job. He was a master over army protocol and was very generous and kind to those who he worked with. On November 5, 1855, he was finally appointed to captain in the quartermaster's department. He accepted it because it was a promotion but he wanted to perform military duties outside of being a quartermaster. In February 1856, the Hancocks were ordered to Florida at Fort Myers. He and his family traveled there not knowing that hostilities were about to begin with the Seminoles. This would be the third attempt to subdue and remove the Seminoles from their homes in Florida. Previous to this, Hancock was a quartermaster for a garrison in an easily accessible landscape. However, now he had to supply the army within a swampy and inaccessible area but the captain performed his duties superbly, with his superiors giving him great compliments for his work. Because of the hostilities, the family was unable to venture out of the garrison. 
Hancock attempted to get a milk cow to his quarters by ship from Tampa four times before the cow survived the journey. Almira and Russell did get to travel upriver on a boat, but had to lie in the bottom of the boat with a heavy rubber blanket covering them every time an Indian was spotted on shore. The situation was especially hard on Almira. She was the only woman at Fort Myers, but she made the best of the situation. Orlando Wilcox commented on Hancock's home by saying it was a perfect oasis in the desert to the rest of us, and the liberal hospitality and genial cordiality of Captain and Miss Hancock shed a glow of sunshine over our precious visits. On February 24th, 1857, the Hancock's second child was born, a girl named Ada. She was the first white child known to be born in Fort Myers. After a little over a year in Florida, Hancock was sent to Fort Leavenworth to oversee quartermaster duties related to the situation known as Bleeding Kansas. By mid-May 1858, he was responsible for outfitting an expedition destined for Utah, led by Albert Sidney Johnston to subdue the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were refusing to recognize the governor sent by President James Buchanan. He assembled a train of 128 wagons, five ambulances, and a thousand mules for the expedition and accompanied it. However, by the time Hancock and the rest of the troops made it to Salt Lake City on June 26, 1858, a peaceful settlement had already been reached. Hancock was then ordered to Fort Bridger in the southwest corner of what is now Wyoming. When he arrived, he found the 6th Regiment unified and ordered to California. Hancock worked diligently to assemble all the necessary supplies for the expedition to California. They began their journey on August 21st and arrived at a town a little northeast of San Francisco on November 15th, having traveled 1,119 miles. Hancock soon took a leave of absence to escort his family to California, but Almira was hesitant. It was Colonel Robert E. Lee who took her aside and explained that it could be fatal to a young couple's happiness to live apart. She took his advice and agreed to make the trip. They first visited Washington, D.C. and intermingled with the town socialites. The Democratic Party being in power, Hancock was right at home politically, as he mingled with Senator Jefferson Davis and Colonel Joseph E. Johnston. On April 4, 1859, the Hancocks left for their trip to California. The trip was a nightmare. They were packed on an overcrowded steamer and went to the Isthmus of Panama, where they disembarked and waited in 100 degree heat for 14 hours without water, hearing rumors that marauders had massacred the last steamer that had traveled through the Isthmus. Once on the Pacific side, they sailed on the ship, the Golden Gate, also overcrowded. A group of men began harassing young Russell, resulting in Winfield getting into a fist fight and whipping them with his bare hands and threatening to kill anyone who came close to his family. The rest of the trip was comparatively calm. They arrived in San Francisco on May 23rd, then orders reached him that he was to go to Los Angeles. They boarded a steamer that afternoon. He was now chief quartermaster of the Southern District of California, headquartered at Los Angeles. Thank you all so much for watching. Please stay tuned for part four coming up next week, and I'll see you next time. Los Angeles didn't offer much to the army inhabitants, except for the beauty of fertile fields and snow-capped mountains in the distance. The town consisted of around 4,000 people, the great majority Spanish-speaking. The only attractions were gambling halls and saloons, but Almira and a lady friend would organize a trip to the coast every so often. But after performing that trip with the coachman carrying a shotgun to scare off coyotes multiple times, the trip got duller and duller. The Catholic majority disapproved of a Protestant church being built so a Philadelphia preacher held service in his home for the tiny congregation. Almira played the pop organ during the service. This was one of the first times in a long time that Winfield lived in a civilian setting where he could make friends outside of army officers. One of these men he became good friends with was Joseph Lancaster Brent, a lawyer from Louisiana. He had come to California to practice law and had developed close ties with the citizenry of Los Angeles. And what made him become good friends with Hancock was that he was a Democrat. Just a short time in the future, when the Civil War would break out, Brent would offer his services to the Confederacy and attain the rank of general. Phineas Banning, a native of Delaware who had traveled to California for the opportunities available there, became a close friend of Hancock as well. Banning created a port for Los Angeles on the San Pedro Bay and organized stage and rail lines to transport people and goods from town to port. Winfield and Phineas became such good friends that Banning named one of his sons, Hancock, in honor of his friend. He would also be an influential promoter of Hancock in his later years as Winfield ran for political office. 
It was in California that Hancock waited for news of the 1860 presidential election. Always a good Democrat, Hancock grew concerned over two things, the rise of the sectional party known as the Republican Party and the splitting of his own Democratic Party, Northern Democrats for Stephen Douglas and Southern Democrats for John C. Breckinridge. Believing that the government had no right to interfere in a domestic institution like slavery, he cast his ballot for John C. Breckinridge. The Deep South began seceding from the Union with the election of Abraham Lincoln, and tensions grew in California. General Edwin Sumner traveled to the state to offer command of all forces there to Albert Sidney Johnston, but Johnston had sent his resignation and cast his lot with Texas, his adopted state. Pro-secessionists in the southern portion of California were rumored to be planning some kind of insurrection and to take over federal supplies in Los Angeles. It was nearly single-handedly that Hancock organized the defense of federal property in his district. However, Winfield knew that the fighting would not be in California if a war was to be had, so he began writing letters to General Scott, Postmaster General Montgomery Blair, and the Governor of Pennsylvania to get transferred east. He decided to stay loyal to the United States. Hancock's biographer explained, Hancock was by heredity and conviction a staunch believer in the integrity of the Union. He had been educated and trained as a soldier by the federal government. The time had come for him to offer his sword, and if necessary, his life in defense of that Union. It was as simple as that and his political disagreements with the administration's policies were of no consequence at all. Hancock reportedly explained his stance as such, My politics are of a practical kind. The integrity of my country, the supremacy of the federal government, and an honorable peace are none at all. Hancock was surrounded by Southern men who were about to dedicate their lives to the Confederacy. They held a party before they all departed for the East to join different sides. Among those at the party were George Pickett, Richard Garnett, Louis Armistead, and Albert Sidney Johnston. Mrs. Johnston sung some heartfelt songs and became emotional at the thought of these army friends going in different directions to fight against one another. One of the most distraught at the thought of abandoning such a good friend was Louis Armistead. He took Hancock by the shoulder and said, Hancock, goodbye. You can never know what this has cost me. I hope God will strike me dead if I am ever induced to leave my native soul, should worse come to worst. He then gave Hancock a brand new major's uniform that he would have no longer use for. Armistead then gave Almira his prayer book inscribed Louis A. Armistead, Trust in God and Fear Nothing. Then the party ended and the separation began. Winfield Scott Hancock and his family left Los Angeles in August 1861, traveled through the Isthmus of Panama and then on to New York, where they took a train to Washington, then to Louisville, Kentucky, where he had been assigned to General Robert Anderson's staff, the Defender of Fort Sumter, as his quartermaster. Hancock was at risk of being stuck in the same position as he had been during the Mexican War in the quartermaster department, barely getting out in time to see action. His ability and reliability as a quartermaster was hurting him again, but Hancock had been training and preparing for war since his days in Mexico. While at Jefferson Barracks in peacetime, he had been the protege of General William Harney, a rough Tennessean who Hancock learned to wield profanity from. Winfield had also been immersing himself in military studies, looking into the campaigns of Caesar, Napoleon, Wellington, and Frederick the Great. Some historians have highlighted Hancock as one of the most prepared officers to take field command during the Civil War. Thankfully for the Pennsylvanian, he was sent to Washington, D.C., where George B. McClellan was organizing the army. Both men had gotten to know one another at West Point and in Mexico, and after a several-hour interview with McClellan, Hancock waited in the capital until a position within the army could be procured. On September 23rd, he was appointed to a brigadier general in the division of William F. Smith. Hancock could breathe easy now that he knew he wouldn't be stuck in the quartermaster department. His brigade was made up of the 5th Wisconsin, 43rd New York, and 47th and 49th Pennsylvania. However, the 47th would soon be transferred and the 6th Maine would take its place. Unlike many of the political appointees that outranked Hancock, Winfield knew what combat entailed, so he wasted no time in instituting stern discipline within his ranks. 
knowing that battles could be won or lost dependent on the ability of troops to obey commands. Although he was a tough commander, his men grew to respect him and trust him with their lives. One way that Hancock enforced discipline was through what one historian called one of the most colored and sulfuric vocabulary in the whole army. He had learned this ability from his old mentor, Harney, and Hancock's troops would recall fondly specific eruptions of swear words. It was not all training, but social gatherings popped up all over Washington, D.C. Most of Hancock's friends, who he had spent time with in the capital in the past, were now on the side of the Confederacy, particularly Johnston and Davis. Hancock's democratic leanings made him keep quiet about his political views in case it might impact his military standing, but he never was one to flaunt his politics in the first place. He was discreet for the most part. Almira and the children rented a house in Washington to be close to Winfield, especially because once campaign started, Hancock knew that they would see less of each other. The couple were invited to a soiree at the White House where only cabinet members, senators, diplomats, and major generals of the army were invited. Hancock and his wife were the only exception to the guest list, him only being a brigadier general. First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln informed Almira that her and her family had showed great hospitality to the Todd family on their trips to St. Louis in the past, and this was a way of reciprocating. In the spring of 1862, McClellan had won approval for the Peninsula Campaign, and on March 23rd, Hancock embarked for Alexandria and wrote to his wife that, I am off at last, and it is a matter of great pain to me that I am unable to see you again before we part. God alone knows for how long. I rode all last night, and while I rode, I did not cease to think of how and where all this unhappiness is to end. By April, the Union Army had arrived at Fort Monroe on the peninsula and began their march toward Richmond, but heavy rain bogged down the army. At the siege of Yorktown that incredibly lasted a month, Hancock and his brigade skirmished with the other side but did nothing substantial to single himself out as anything spectacular. In May, at the Battle of Williamsburg, he got the opportunity to display his effectiveness at command. Joseph Hooker's division attacked Fort Magruder, while Hancock's superiors sent Winfield with five regiments to the far right of the Union line in order to occupy a supposedly abandoned redoubt at Fort Magruder. He was accompanied by a young officer on William F. Smith's staff named George Armstrong Custer. After crossing Cub Dam Creek, Hancock took the abandoned redoubt and informed his commander that another apparently abandoned redoubt was about 1,200 yards ahead of his position. Smith informed Hancock that reinforcements would be sent immediately and to take it. Winfield did as he was told, and upon taking the position, realized that from that vantage point, he could see the entire Confederate line and their entire allocation of troops. Ahead of his men was another fortified position, this time with enemy troops within them. Hancock called up his artillery and delivered a withering fire into the Confederates who pulled back. Winfield wanted to take that advanced position, but the reinforcements had not made it to the advanced line that he occupied. In fact, Smith sent him a message that he was unable to send the reinforcements and to pull back to his first position. Hancock was irate at the order. Custer observed firsthand the string of expletives that the Pennsylvanian could spew forth when the order reached him. Hancock sent an engineer officer with detailed information to Smith about how critical it was for the brigade to keep the advanced position for the integrity of the entire army's position. Winfield stated in his response that if no response was made in a reasonable amount of time that he would follow orders. He was walking a fine line of insubordination, but he did not want to give up such a strategic advantage. After an hour of waiting, he was about to pull back his brigade, but at that moment, Confederate infantry began approaching his brigade. This was a critical moment for Hancock. If he failed to repel the attack after already being ordered to withdraw, his career could be over through the extreme damage of reputation. The Confederates opposing him were two Virginia regiments led by Jubal Early and two North Carolina regiments led by Daniel Harvey Hill. Hancock feigned a retreat by pulling his men up a hill, but once the enemy got within range, his brigade let loose two volleys. Then he rode up and down his line yelling, Gentlemen, charge with the bayonet! On the order, the blue troops raced down the hill puncturing many frontline enemy troops and sending them to the rear. With Hancock's presence on the extreme left of the Confederate line, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, although already planning to fall back, was forced to by the actions of Hancock. His possible insubordination was forgotten, and McClellan wired the Secretary of War describing Winfield's actions as superb, and the name stuck. Hancock the Superb would be seen in newspapers all over the North. McClellan's army pressed on to Richmond, 
where Johnston was wounded and replaced by Robert E. Lee. The successive battles are known as the Seven Days Campaign. At Gaines Mill, Hancock's brigade was tested once again, this time being attacked by and repulsing Robert Toombs' brigade, inflicting heavy casualties on the Georgians' men. The Union Army pulled back after each Confederate attack, and at White Oak Swamp, Hancock's men withstood a heavy barrage of artillery from Stonewall Jackson's troops and repulsed a half-hearted attempt by the Confederate general who judged the location too difficult to cross and simply went to sleep under a tree. The rest of the campaign saw little to no action for Hancock's men. His total casualties for the Seven Days Campaign was about 200 men, small compared to other embattled units. However, his ambition and standout performance at Williamsburg and Gaines Mill put him ahead in reputation among the Army of the Potomac. McClellan and his army moved back down the peninsula and waited for orders to return to Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. Hancock and his men remained at Fort Monroe until transports could be sent them to aid General Pope's Army of Virginia, but by the time that the corps in which Hancock was in made it to Northern Virginia, a series of miscommunication and lack of cooperation made him miss the Battle of Second Manassas. However, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was now moving into Maryland, and the Union Army, again under George McClellan, would pursue the invading rebels. The 6th Corps commander, William B. Franklin, could be just as slow as McClellan at attacking the enemy. Therefore, although an opportunity to strike at the rebels after crossing Crampton's Gap was clear, the Corps commander refused to commit any of his brigades, including Hancock's. The two armies collided at a little town called Sharpsburg on the Antietam Creek that fed into the Potomac River, and Hancock sat relatively unused during the entire battle, that is, until fate thrust him into a new position. General Israel B. Richardson and his division of the 2nd Corps had launched numerous assaults against the Bloody Lane. While he was doing this, a shell fragment from an artillery barrage hit him and he had to be carried from the field. He would die two months later from complications from the wounding including infection. McClellan, knowing the capability of Hancock, ordered him to take command of Richardson's division. It took him a while to place his brigade under its new successor and make it to the location of Richardson's division, but when he arrived, McClellan ordered him to dig in and repel any attack made against his line. The division withstood a withering barrage of artillery while they waited for a possible attack, but other than a small Confederate contingent making an appearance on his left, but was driven away by artillery, Hancock and his new command waited through the night and into the next day, and ordered not to engage in hostilities. Lee's army retreated from the outskirts of Sharpsburg, and McClellan stayed put. A month later, he ordered Hancock and his division to cross the Potomac River at Harper's Ferry and reconnoiter the ground. Winfield pressed as far as Charlestown, drove away its light rebel defenders, and occupied the city. McClellan journeyed to the town in person to talk with Hancock, and after the discussion, became satisfied that no Confederate attack would be forthcoming and pulled back the division. On November 5, 1862, Lincoln removed McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac and replaced him with Ambrose Burnside. Hancock was good friends with McClellan. It had been Little Mac who had gotten him an infantry command and installed him as a division commander. But he also saw the missed opportunity in letting Lee's army return across the Potomac and to sit idle on September 18th. He made the comment to those grumbling in the army, We are serving no one man. We are serving our country. Now at the head of a division, Hancock performed his duties masterfully as always. An aide in great detail described the 38-year-old officer. He was tall, with straight hair, now a light brown, a mustache and a tuft on his chin of the same color, well-cut features, a firm jaw, and deep blue eyes. He was always neatly dressed, and one of the wonders of the Army of the Potomac was the fact that Hancock always wore a clean white shirt, well pressed, even in the midst of a long march or a protracted battle. His years in the quartermaster department prepared him for the mountains of paperwork and correspondence necessary to be a division commander, and he was meticulous toward proper procedure. Even the smallest detail came under scrutiny of Hancock toward his subordinates, but as they said, he would never inflate the small details at the expense of larger ones. Hancock always wanted to know what was going on within his division, and in this respect we see why his men loved him so much. He took the time and care to know the names of his subordinates. He met with them as often as he could, getting to know them and their demeanor. 
These actions would pay dividends for the division commander when large battles erupted and he was expected to order certain brigades and regiments into a fight. He needed to know who was the best commander for certain situations. Hancock always played the long game when it came to his actions and behavior. One thing he liked to do was to woo newspaper reporters. He loved having them in camp. This action can be seen as twofold. One, he wanted him and his command to be portrayed in the best light when northern newspapers were constantly criticizing the Army of the Potomac. And two, having prominent leaders and commands featured in stories could boost the morale of not only the army, but the nation. At one point later in the war, a newspaper writer did his command injustice with a story, and he even called for the arrest of the reporter. However, he even made reporters members of his staff or gave them positions within his command if they seemed to possess the qualities that he deemed necessary for achieving victory, and he was correct in his estimations. The men he gave those commissions to performed admirably in battle and contributed positively to the Union war effort. Soon after the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. Hancock's political beliefs did not like the idea of the federal government interfering in the domestic institutions of the South, but again, when he looked around, secession and the Confederacy had called into question the Constitution itself. He understood that this would not be a short war and that extra constitutional means may be involved to suppress the rebellion. He did not like it, but he was willing to do what it took to preserve the Union. General Burnside marched his army to the Rappahannock River, across from the town of Fredericksburg. There he waited for pontoon bridges to arrive in order to cross. It looked as though Burnside had outmaneuvered Robert E. Lee. Beyond the town lay a series of heights known as Mary's Heights, and before pontoon bridges could make it to Burnside, Lee began occupying those areas and digging in where necessary. The Union Army commander was still determined to attack Lee there. Edwin Sumner, prior to the fighting, called together all of his division and brigade commanders, which included Hancock. Sumner vouched for Burnside and attempted to describe how the attack could work out in the Union's favor. Darius Couch and Winfield Hancock spoke up at this meeting and described how disastrous the attacks could be. Later, Burnside heard about this meeting and called together the same group of men, where he singled out Hancock. The division commander reinforced his belief that attacking the well-entrenched enemy would not end well for the Federal forces. Burnside stated that the plan would work and all he asked was for the loyal obedience to his orders. November 29, 1862, Hancock became a Major General of Volunteers. The very next day, he acquired the rank of Major in the Quartermaster Corps. Although the Major's rank meant little at the time, when the war was over and the wartime armies diminished, that rank would help his standing in the post-war army. It was Hancock's men who would help support the engineers assembling the pontoons across the river. The 66th and 57th New York regiments attempted to support the engineers from the riverbank, but ended up crossing the river to rid the opposite side of Confederate sharpshooters wreaking havoc on the poor engineers. The two regiments lost 150 men killed and wounded before the pontoon bridge was completed on December 11th. Once across, Hancock's division was the second division to attack the entrenched Confederates under General James Longstreet on the rebel left flank. French's division went in first, then behind them was Hancock. Winfield sent Zook's brigade first, then the Irish brigade, then finally Caldwell's men, but none of them could budge the Confederate line. The blue troops had to cross a canal, then weather the withering artillery fire across hundreds of yards in open terrain. Then within rifle fire, the Confederate infantry let loose volley after volley. By the end of the day, of around 5,000 men that Hancock sent into battle, 2,000 were casualties. Over the next day or so, the division recrossed the river, defeated. Years after the war, a Confederate infantryman who had defended Mary's Heights against Hancock heard someone proclaim that Pickett's men during Pickett's charge was the most heroic charge ever made. The old veteran replied by saying, I was with Lee's army from the beginning and surrendered at Appomattox, and I never saw anything that surpassed the charge made by Hancock and Humphreys at Fredericksburg. After the debacle at Fredericksburg, Hancock would get a leave of absence to go visit his wife and children in St. Louis. Therefore, he missed out on Burnside's mud march. He would rejoin his command in the spring of 1863 and diligently went back to work preparing his men for upcoming engagements. Hancock loved for his troops to drill on the division's parade ground. 
He also took great pleasure in streaming together cuss words at his brigade commanders if a mistake was made during the drill. General Samuel K. Zook became the focus of the division commander's rants, more so from playful bantering because Zook had no problem throwing the swear words back at his commander, and the two grew closer through their little squabbles on the parade ground. In early 1863, Abraham Lincoln changed commanders, this time to General Joseph Hooker. Hooker was a meticulous organizer, which helped place the army in better standing. For instance, he revamped the leave system, which allowed the individual soldiers to know when their leave of absence would be. This ultimately decreased desertions, since the troops knew when to expect a break and to see their family in rest. He also implemented the insignias for the different corps. Hooker did a lot of good for the army, and in April he launched his advance against Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. The Southerners occupied Fredericksburg, so Hooker split his army, leaving three corps to guard the Rappahannock near that town, and the rest of the army would move across the river and the Rapidan at multiple locations. Once on the other side, Hooker's men would march east and trap Lee and his army between two halves of the army. At least that was the plan. It was a good plan. He even took Lee by surprise, who had already divided his force by sending General Longstreet and some of his troops south. Lee was now outnumbered, and the Union Army was now taking advantage. The aggressiveness of Hooker was paying off. The Union Corps moved through the dense forested area known as the Wilderness and emerged from it on the River Road, the Turnpike, and the Plank Road. But by this point, Lee was aware that Hooker was on the move, and again split his force leaving around 10,000 men to guard Fredericksburg, while the rest marched west to confront Hooker. General Sykes' men first encountered Lafayette McClaw's men along the turnpike. The tough resistance destroyed the confidence of Hooker, and he ordered all of his corps to pull back to the Wilderness and the Chancellorsville area, choosing to remain in the difficult terrain that made his numbers negligible compared to the open ground just to the east. Hancock and his corps commander, General Couch, pleaded along with others to press on, but there was no change in Hooker's decision. The aggressiveness had faded, and now he was on the defensive. Hancock's men dug in at the center of the Union line near the community of Chancellorsville. Lee's bluff had worked, and he and his right-hand man, General Stonewall Jackson, hatched a bold plan. Since Hooker was not going to move, this provided an opportunity to strike the Union Army's right flank, guarded by the 11th Corps under Oliver Otis Howard. Jackson moved three divisions around the Union Army and launched that assault. At about 5 p.m. on May 2nd, the Confederates launched their assault on the Union right flank. As it crumbled, McClaws launched his own attacks against Hancock's division. The Pennsylvanian held out after multiple attacks by the Southerners. To make things worse for the Union Army, Hooker, at his headquarters at the Chancellorsville Mansion, got hit in the head and back by a fallen pillar struck by an artillery shell. He was dazed the rest of the fight, but thoroughly convinced he was surrounded and outnumbered, when in reality much of his line was holding firm, especially the 2nd Corps. Intimidated by the heavy assaults against his line, Hooker assembled some defenses but ultimately ordered for the withdrawal of his forces back across the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers. However, the Southerners were still pressing in on the Union defenders. At one point, Winfield was fighting a foe in front of his position and behind his position as he guarded the roads to the fords. General Jeb Stuart had taken over for Jackson after the wounding of Stonewall, and the young cavalier was pushing hard against the Union line, but Hancock doggedly held on for dear life, directing his troops from horseback. As cannonballs and bullets whizzed by him, he never flinched. He was focused on allocating his troops where they were needed. Finally, Hancock was able to safely get his men across the rivers and be known as the saviors of the Union Army. After the military disaster that was the Battle of Chancellorsville, the Army of the Potomac went through drastic changes. For one, Darius Couch, the commander of the 2nd Corps, became so disgusted by the actions or lack of action by Army Commander Joseph Hooker that he requested reassignment, which he received. Hancock was the natural choice for Couch's position, but his rise to Corps command would come about during a tumultuous time. Abraham Lincoln and other commanders were irritated at Hooker's actions, so the tensions within the army was immense. But Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia were on the move, causing more problems for the Federals. Due to Jeb Stuart's screening movements, all Hooker knew was that the Confederate Army was moving, but had no idea where. Slowly, the Blue Troops began moving north, chasing after the Rebels. 
It was during this pursuit that Lincoln relieved Hooker of command, an action that took Hooker by surprise since a large battle was imminent. The president had searched for a replacement. One of his first choices was John Reynolds, commander of the First Corps, but he wanted to be assured that he wouldn't be drawn into political infighting in Washington, D.C. Finally, Lincoln settled on George Meade, but there were rumors that Hancock was considered, but Winfield wrote to his wife that he would have refused had he been offered the position. Now, the Union Army was under a new commander, and Hancock had been in command of a corps for less than a month as this grand campaign was being launched. Meade threw himself into making the best of it. After meeting with Meade, Hancock commented that the commander seemed nervous, but unlike other commanders, he was not afraid of Lee. One notable incident of the campaign related to Hancock was that when the Second Corps arrived at Uniontown, Maryland, the locals informed him that Jeb Stuart's cavalry were occupying Westminster just four miles away. Hancock sent word to Meade about the possibility of possibly capturing such an illustrious prize, but Union Cavalry Commander Alfred Pleasanton assured Meade that two Union brigades of cavalry were at Westminster and the locals must have been mistaken. In reality, there were no Federal cavalry in the town. It was indeed Jeb Stuart, but since Pleasanton convinced Meade it wasn't, Hancock did not act on the information. Another significant moment happened for Hancock on the campaign. General French, one of his division commanders, requested an independent command, which he received. Hancock's longtime friend, Alexander Hayes, was then given command of French's division. By the very end of June, Union Corps were converging near the town of Gettysburg on a crash course with elements of A.P. Hill's Confederate Corps. On July 1st, they collided, and Confederate reinforcements began outflanking the Union troops. Word got to me that an engagement was underway, and that Reynolds had either been seriously wounded or killed. Either way, there needed to be an overall commander on the field. Meade quickly met with Hancock and told him to ride ahead, leaving his corps in the command of General Gibbon and take command of all the corps at Gettysburg. Winfield pointed out that Oliver Otis Howard, the commander of the 11th Corps, outranked him, but Meade assured him that all necessary steps were taken and that he was to take control of the situation. If he could find good ground in that vicinity, take it, but if not, he was to retreat to Pipe Creek to form a defensive line that Meade had mapped out. Off Hancock Road, but for about three miles, he opted to ride in an ambulance, not for any medical reason, but he needed to study the maps of the area in preparation for a taken command. Once he had familiarized himself with the terrain, he again mounted his horse and rode hard for Gettysburg. He arrived at 3.30 p.m. on Cemetery Hill, the location of Howard's Reserve and one of the only places still under firm Union control. Although the next event has many versions, most with only slight differences, most historians agree with the following account. When he informed Howard, his senior, that he had been placed in command and had written orders to prove it, Howard allegedly made a small fuss about military protocol, but nevertheless, Hancock quickly began issuing orders regardless of what the other corps commanders thought. It was Hancock who ordered James Wadsworth's division to secure Culp's Hill, seeing it as militarily significant. He also sent Geary's division from the 12th Corps to secure the Union left near two round hills to the south. Next, Hancock sent his aide, Major William G. Mitchell, with information to give to Meade. He informed the Army commander that he possessed a strong position and would hold out until nightfall to see if Meade wanted to bring up the whole army. Meade simply stated, I will send up the troops. At 6 p.m., with the lines for the most part stabilized, Hancock found General Slocum and turned over command to him. Then Winfield rode to Tawnytown to report to General Meade in person. After their meeting, Hancock exhausted after a long day, stretched out and got a few hours of sleep, but was awake at midnight, riding to rejoin the 2nd Corps just outside of Gettysburg. One of the most common discussions about the Battle of Gettysburg revolves around a what-if question. What if the Confederates had pushed on and taken Cemetery Hill? In an 1878 letter to Fitzhugh Lee, Hancock answers that very question. He stated, I do not think the Confederate force then present could have carried it out. He made that statement because he saw the confusion within the Confederate ranks when they pushed into the town. That is one problem with a victorious assault. Afterward, the battle lines are very confused and malformed. Hancock believed that by the time all the Confederate officers reformed their lines, rounded up all the prisoners, and resupplied the ranks, he had the Union position secure. On the night of July 1st, the Second Corps camped in between the Tawny Town Road and Big Round Top, just in case Lee decided to shift southwest and turn the Union line. 
The next day, Hancock placed his corps on Cemetery Ridge, with Hayes near Ziegler's Grove, Gibbon's division in the center, and Caldwell on the left. To the left of Hancock's Second Corps was the Third Corps under Daniel Sickles. On July 2nd, Sickles made a horrible mistake. By thinking his position untenable, he moved out his divisions to occupy a position further west along the Emmitsburg Road, disconnecting from the Second Corps to his right and not anchoring his left flank. Hancock watched in amazement as he saw Sickles' men marching without orders. By the time Meade found out about the movement, it was too late to pull back safely because Confederate General James Longstreet's corps was launching a massive assault against the exposed Third Corps. The next hour saw the Fifth Corps under Sykes attempt to shore up the position around Little Round Top, the Wheatfield, and Devil's Den. However, the advance by Sickles exposed Hancock's left flank. Thus, Winfield had to send Caldwell's division to the aid of Sykes and Sickles. The Third Corps' mistake would cost Hancock's corps dearly. Caldwell's 1st Brigade under Colonel Edward E. Cross headed toward Devil's Den to drive out the rebels. The Irish Brigade, after receiving the general absolution from Father William Corby, moved into the woods just south of the wheat field. Next, Zook's Brigade made its way into the Carnage Field area. Caldwell even sent in his reserve under Colonel John R. Brooke, but on his right, the Union forces were given way from attacks by Kershaw's South Carolinians and Barksdale's Mississippians. So, Caldwell had to pull back his division. Three of his four brigade commanders were casualties. Zook and Cross were both mortally wounded, and Brooke was severely wounded. When Sickles was wounded, losing a leg, Meade placed Hancock in charge of the 3rd Corps as well. Winfield rode to the left of his line, bringing Willard's brigade from Hayes' division. Barksdale's Mississippians were on their way to Cemetery Ridge. Hancock placed Willard's men in their way, but to his right he saw what he thought was Union infantry, but a volley from their ranks that wounded his aide signaled to him that it was the enemy. Hancock quickly looked about and saw a 300-man regiment coming up from the rear. He rode over to them and said, Do you see those colors? Take them. The regiment was the 1st Minnesota, who charged into Wilcox's brigade of Confederates. They paid a frightful cost, but they had halted the rebel advance. Further to the right, Ambrose Wright's Georgians pressed Hancock's men at the stone wall along Cemetery Ridge. But the Southerners were thrown back, but not after gaining much ground. Abner Doubleday said of Hancock that day, he was indefatigable, and his vigilance and personal supervision, patching the line wherever the enemy was likely to break through. His activity and foresight probably preserved the ridge from capture. Even as nightfall began to cover the battlefield, Hancock's exploits were not complete. On the far end of his line at Cemetery Hill, he heard the roaring sound of battle and dispatched Carroll's brigade of Hayes' division to offer any assistance he could to Oliver Owens Howard's position. They arrived just in time to send back the rebels from the ground they had gained in the bloody fight. He also sent two regiments to Culp's Hill to repel the evening assaults against that position. That night, Meade summoned all of his corps commanders to meet at his headquarters. In a room about ten feet square, they discussed what happened that day and what to do next. It was agreed that the position they held at that moment was a strong one, and to stay put. They also agreed that they should wait on Lee to make the next move but there was some debate on how long they should wait. However, with no clear decision about the wait time, Meade left it up to his own discretion, and the council broke up. Generals Hancock, John Gibbon, and John Newton then found a second corps ambulance, crawled in, and went to sleep. Hancock was up early, getting his troops ready. Meade concluded earlier that Lee would strike the center of his line where Hancock's men were located, but by 9 a.m., Meade met with Hancock and had changed his opinion. He now believed that an attack would come on the left again. An associate of Gibbon captured a tough old rooster and with the help of some taters, turned it into a stew. As Gibbon and Hancock sat on some old stools delighting in the welcome new food variety, Meade and a staff member, General Newton and General Pleasanton, happened by and they all got a portion of the meal. After the meal, the officers sat under a tree passing the day pretty lazily, talking about the battle the day before. After about an hour, Pleasanton, Newton, and Meade left. Hancock could see the rebels on Seminary Ridge placing their artillery in preparation for something. When the gigantic artillery barrage let loose from the rebel guns, the men of the Second Corps hugged the ground, and 77 pieces of Union artillery began firing back. The guns fired for nearly two hours, and the artillerymen began to slacken their fire or stop altogether to conserve ammunition. Hancock became concerned for his infantry because he knew that in the event of an artillery barrage, the best morale boost for infantry 
is to have their own artillery firing back. So Winfield ordered all of his 2nd Corps artillery to keep letting loose volleys. He even ordered gun crews not under his command to continue, but Lt. Col. Freeman McGilvery refused the orders for his crews. He stated that Hancock had no authority to give him such an order. The two battled with profane language, but Hancock could not convince the man to do as he ordered. Hancock was on the left of his line when Pickett's charge began. He commented in his after-action report how well the battle lines were dressed as they moved across the field. His artillery had used up all their long-range ammunition and thus waited for the enemy to get closer to use their canister. Hayes on the right broke up the brigades of Brock and Braun Davis. Generals Lewis Armistead and Richard Garnett, who had attended the party with Hancock right before they left for war, had been very good friends with him, and they were in Pickett's division, barreling toward the copse of trees, the focal point of the Confederate advance. Garnett would be killed, and Armistead would be severely wounded and die a few days later, but as he lay wounded on the ground, Captain Henry Bingham told Armistead that he was a member of Hancock's staff, and he would make sure any of his effects were taken care of. Armistead told Bingham, Say to General Hancock for me that I have done him and you all a grievous injury which I shall always regret. After shoring up the breakthrough that Armistead and his men swarmed into, Hancock moved over to the left, finding the 13th Vermont there. He ordered them to turn and perform a flanking maneuver against the Confederate right. About that time, Hancock was wounded in the groin. The men from Vermont helped him off his horse and laid him on the ground, but he refused to be moved until the battle was over, so he propped himself up on one elbow and watched over the battle. The commander of the 16th Vermont and Hancock's friend passed by and Winfield said to him, go in Colonel and give it to them on the flank. The Vermonters did as they were told and broke up what was left of the Confederate assault. Only after the hostilities had ended did Hancock allow for the Corps surgeon to examine him. Hancock and Armistead had come a long way from Los Angeles, wounded just a few hundred yards apart, fighting one another. In true Hancock military fashion, he took his responsibility as an officer seriously. So when he was loaded into an ambulance and the wagon took off, he quickly ordered it to stop so he could dictate to the surgeon a letter to be given to General Meade. I have never seen a more formidable attack, and if the 6th and 5th Corps have pressed up, the enemy will be destroyed. The enemy must be short of ammunition, as I was shot with a ten-penny nail. I did not leave the field till the victory was entirely secured, and the enemy no longer in sight. I am badly wounded, but I trust not seriously. I had to break the line to attack the enemy in flank on my right, where the enemy was most persistent after their front attack was propelled. Not a rebel was in sight upright when I left. The line should be immediately restored and perfected. General Caldwell is in command of the Corps, and I have directed him to restore the line. The ten-penny nail that he mentioned in his address to Meade had actually came from his saddle, along with some wood into the wound. The surgeon was able to probe with his finger and extract the ten-penny nail and stop the blood, but it was a serious wound so close to a main artery. When he made it to the hospital for the Corps, his men crowded around him and gave shouts of acclamation. He attempted to address the crowd, but weak from blood loss, he fainted into his comrade's arms. Any time the Army of the Potomac was in action, Hancock would wire his wife a message letting her know he was safe. He had wired her that morning saying he was all right so far. Without including too much information, he informed her that he had been wounded and to meet him in Philadelphia where he was to recover. The Army surgeon had been able to extract the ten penny nail and the wood that entered the wound with the bullet, but had been unable to recover the lead projectile. The day after his wounding, he rode in an ambulance over bumpy roads in excruciating pain to a railhead, then on to Philadelphia. There he was under the care of a gunshot specialist, Dr. D.H. Agnew, and after numerous attempts at probing the wound trying to find the bullet, the doctor could not find the projectile. Over the next couple of weeks, the wound continued to drain and not heal. The horrible heat made Hancock stay in Philadelphia miserable, and thus it was decided to move him to Norristown, hoping that it might be cooler a little further north. When he arrived by rail to Norristown, a detail from the Invalid Corps carried his stretcher from the Norristown station to his parents' home on Swede Street. In agony and not getting any better, Winfield still insisted on taking care of military matters. He wired Meade and recommended that Governor Warren take temporary command of the 2nd Corps while he was unable to perform that duty. 
Meade was favoring Warren too, and he was placed in temporary command of Hancock's troops. By the end of July, the situation was looking worse for Hancock. He wasn't getting any better, and the bullet was still lodged in his thigh next to the groin. Dr. Lewis W. Reed, a native of Norristown, Pennsylvania, was in charge of the Army Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, but he was on leave in his hometown when Hancock was there recovering. He paid the general a visit. The doctor was shocked to find Hancock looking pale and emaciated and talking of death. The general said he had been probed and tortured so much that death would be a relief. As Reed arose from the bedside, Hancock said, Goodbye, doctor. I may never see you again. Reed had made his way to the door when Hancock had another thought. See here, doctor. Why don't you try to get this ball out? I have had all the reputation in the country at it. Now let's have some of the practical. Reed noted that Hancock was lying in bed with his right leg flexed. All the probing had been done with his leg bent at right angles, yet he had been hit while in the saddle with his legs extended. The doctor felt that he could find the ball if he could get Hancock's leg into the same position it had been in when he was shot. With an aid, he managed to straighten the limb and had Hancock straddle a chair placed on top of the dining room table. From across the room, Reed sighted the probable trajectory of the bullet and then inserted the probe into the wound at the angle so sighted. The probe, Reed said, dropped fully eight inches into the channel and struck the ball, which was embedded in the sharp bone which you sit upon. He was then able to extract the large mini ball. Once it was removed, Hancock's recovery truly began. After only a week, he was up on his feet using crutches. By mid-September, he left Norristown and visited New York City and West Point. Then he traveled to St. Louis to spend time at his wife's family's home, where he and Almira and the children stayed for six weeks. He stopped using the crutches at that time and began using a cane to support himself. However, since Winfield was not constantly on the move, like he had been most of his life, the stationary lifestyle while recovering resulted in a considerable amount of weight gain. A soldier who cast their eyes on him the next year stated, If, as has been asserted, all flesh is grass, General Hancock may be said to be a load of hay. He actually would never lose the weight that he gained while convalescing. During the fall and into December of 1863, Hancock read letters from his friends in the Army and newspapers describing the military situation as it pertained to the Army of the Potomac. Meade had done a lot of maneuvering against Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia, but pressure was on him from Washington to defeat Lee. After the aborted Mine Run campaign, rumors swirled that Meade would be replaced and Hancock's name came up in the conversations. Winfield and Meade had a deep conversation through a series of letters about the situation. Hancock told his army commander that, I am no aspirant, and I never could be a conspirator had I other feelings toward you than I possess. I would sooner command a corps under you than have the supreme command. I have faith in you. I have always served faithfully, and so intend to do. I would always prefer a good man to command that army than to command it myself. If I ever command it, it will be given to me as it was to you. I shall never express or imply a desire to command, for I do not feel it. On December 29th, he took back command of the 2nd Corps, but found he was unable to perform all of his duties and thus requested a commission to examine his absence. They looked over his leave and found him still not fit for duty, and he was sent back north on January 8, 1864. Hancock spent from January to March traveling through the major northern cities, as requested by the War Department, to boost recruitment by making speeches and inspiring men with his presence to join the army but war weariness was plaguing the North. He was also engaged in a war of letters with all of Rodas Howard. Congress had issued a joint resolution of thanks to Meade, Howard, and Hooker for the victory at Gettysburg, leaving out Hancock's name. The Army and Navy Journal published a correction for the resolution by telling about Howard's shortcomings and the accomplishments of Hancock. Howard wrote to Winfield to see if he had been behind the article, and the 2nd Corps commander set him straight that he had done nothing of the sort. Hancock also defended Meade in the inquiry against the army commander for his actions at Gettysburg. Hancock's reputation and statements helped save Meade's position. At the end of March, Hancock was well enough to rejoin the 2nd Corps. However, it looked very different. Meade had reorganized the army, doing away with some corps and merging their units into the existing ones. The 2nd Corps also got a new division commander, Francis Channing Barlow, formerly attached to the 11th Corps, severely wounded at Gettysburg, captured, and then exchanged, he was known as a tough fighter, and Hancock wanted him a part of his corps. The Army also had another addition, the presence of Lieutenant General 
Ulysses S. Grant, the commander of all Union forces, gave Meade a directive. Lee's army will be your objective point. Wherever Lee goes, there you will go also. With that, the Army of the Potomac and Hancock began the Overland Campaign in early May. In early May, Grant moved the Army of the Potomac across the Rapidan River, attempting to get on Lee's flank and maybe even separate the Confederate general from the Confederate capital, Richmond. It was a decisive move on Grant's part, and Hancock was a vital part of that movement, moving his large Second Corps across the river at Ely's Ford, and from there he moved to the old Chancellorsville battlefield, where he was to bivouac for the night on May 4th. It was an eerie place for Hancock's troops, who found the bones of Union and Confederate troops unburied from the year before. Hancock's wound had not fully healed. He was still in great pain when he rode a horse, so he rode in an ambulance when his army moved, but he informed his wife that when an engagement erupted, he had to mount his horse and fight through the excruciating pain of riding. The Corps then moved west. This caught Lee off guard, and the rebel commander quickly set his army into motion to engage the Union Army in the thick underbrush of the wilderness, where their numbers would mean less. In general, Hancock moved his troops with great quickness, one of the fastest commanders in either army. So when the 5th Corps and the 6th Corps were attacked on the turnpike, Winfield's men were nearly two miles beyond where Meade envisioned him of being. Therefore, when Meade ordered Hancock back to Todd's Tavern, he had to reverse course. Learning that Confederates could use the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and the Brock Road as a way to cut the Union Army in two, Grant and Meade ordered Hancock to continue up the Brock Road and then take the Orange Plank Road to secure the Union left flank. It would be along this road that Hancock would come into contact with General A.P. Hill's Corps. The wilderness produced a chaotic situation for both armies, and when units did move, the formations were broken up by the dense undergrowth. Hancock did his best to follow the series of orders streaming to him from Meade's headquarters. The couriers arrived late with his orders to support General Getty in his attack. Despite being late, Hancock got his corps moving as quickly as he could. It was around this time that one of the couriers described the Second Corps commander's stoic nature in battle when he witnessed Hancock sitting astride his horse and observing his close friend and division commander, Alexander Hayes' body, being brought back on a stretcher. Hancock didn't flinch, but sat stoically as his friend passed by, even though he was deeply affected by the loss. The fighting died down as darkness covered the field and both armies began to dig in where they stopped. The morning of May 6th opened with Hancock's Corps attacking the battered brigades of A.P. Hill's Corps at 5 a.m. The Confederates were taken off guard and began falling back quickly. The Union troops began to suffer from their success. The wilderness had confused the ranks of his soldiers and officers lost contact with some of their men, but they were nevertheless pushing west. Hancock was ecstatic. One of Meade's couriers made it to the Corps commander and he replied, we are driving them, sir. Tell General Meade we are driving them most beautifully. Bernie has gone in and is just cleaning them out beautifully. However, that courier had some unfortunate news to give Hancock. Burnside and his corps, which was supposed to form on his right and attack with him, had failed to do so. Thus, his flank was unsupported. When Longstreet and his corps arrived at the last minute on the field, this brought Hancock's attack to a halt. His men pulled back to some defenses, but the Confederates were on the move. And so was a fire, created by flashes from rifle and cannon muzzles. At one point, the breastworks protected Mott's division, caught on fire and the Federals pulled back. This allowed for the Confederate troops to charge through the fire and create a break in Hancock's line. Despite the breakthrough, Hancock and all of his division commanders worked tirelessly to regain the breastworks. On May 7th, the two sides fired shots at one another, but no major fighting occurred. That night, Warren's V Corps was ordered to do a night march. The Second Corps watched with concern as their comrades marched behind them. Concern because if they turned east to take the plank road, that meant they were retreating and the fighting had been all in vain. But when the Fifth Corps continued their march south along the Brock Road, Hancock's men cheered so loudly that the Confederates thought there was an attack and began firing their rifles into the Federal breastworks. This lifted up the spirits of the entire Union Army. The Second Corps moved out as well, this time south. There would be no retreating now. It was on to Richmond. However, a traffic jam did emerge along the road toward Spotsylvania Courthouse. This contributed to Lee being able to set up defenses before Grant got there. At first, Hancock was ordered to assail the Confederate left to the west, but got recalled 
at the last minute to come and attack the Confederate center near a place termed the Mule Shoe because of the way the Confederates were entrenched in a semicircle. On the morning of May 12th and delayed 35 minutes until 4.35 a.m. because of fog, Hancock ordered one of the grandest assaults of the Civil War. Generals Barlow and Burney's division were in front with Mott and Gibbon's divisions in the rear. Lee made a critical mistake. 30 pieces of artillery guarded the mule shoot, but he was concerned of a movement made to the east and pulled out 22 of the 30 guns. At the last second, they reversed course and reoccupied the mule shoot, but just as they set up, Hancock's men burst forth through the woods and scaled the entrenchments, erupting in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Federals chased off the Confederates and captured multiple pieces of artillery and two Confederate generals, Edward Johnson and George Maryland Stewart. Johnson had known Hancock for a long time, and when the two prisoners made it to Winfield, Edward, with tears in his eyes, threw his arms around Hancock and embraced him and said, This is bad luck, yet I would rather have had this good fortune to fall to you than to any other man living. The encounter with Stuart was vastly different. Hancock, while in Washington, D.C., had met Stuart's wife, and he wanted to give the Confederate general news of her. Hancock asked, How are you, Stuart? and extended his hand. George said, I am General Stewart of the Confederate Army, and under present circumstances, I decline to take your hand. Hancock replied, And under any other circumstances, General Stewart, I should not have offered it. You should not have put an affront upon me in the presence of my officers and soldiers. From 6 a.m. until after midnight, the two armies experienced one of the most brutal episodes of bloodletting during the war. The two sides fought at many times within arm's length of one another, sending bayonets into the enemy through the holes in the breastworks, and firing on each other at point-blank range. The cold rain kept up all day, and the bodies of the dead and wounded were trampled down into the mud and the blood. Trees were cut down by the incessant musketry, and still the survivors battled on. Eventually, Lee pulled his troops back to a defensive line a couple of hundred yards behind the mule shoe. Looking over the fought-over ground, Nelson Miles wrote, It looks like a slaughter pen and is a sight to make anyone sick of war. It was the only ground that I ever saw during the war that was so completely covered with dead and wounded that it was impossible to walk over it without stepping on dead bodies. Ulysses S. Grant chose the Second Corps to play a pivotal role in the next phase of the Overland Campaign. On May 21st, Hancock moved his corps east and south, separating himself more and more from the main body. This was all in Grant's plan. He wanted to draw General Lee away from his position around Spotsylvania Courthouse by offering him what the Confederate commander loved best, defeating the enemy in detail. Lee had done this multiple times, singling out a Union force and defeating them before the whole army could concentrate, and Grant hoped he would take the bait by going after Hancock's corps. It was at this entrenched area that some brand new recruits attached to the Second Corps dug in as they were told, but quickly came under Confederate artillery fire. An officer from the unit rode to Hancock and complained, General, our breastwork is only bulletproof, and the rebels are shelling us. Hancock calmly asked, Killed anybody? The inexperienced officer stated, Not yet, sir. Well, Hancock said, You can tell them to take it comfortably. The rebels often throw shells and I am sure I cannot prevent them. Grant had great confidence in Hancock, and that is the reason he chose the Pennsylvanian for the task. He knew that the 2nd Corps could hold their own against the Army of Northern Virginia until Grant could take Lee by surprise. However, Lee was too smart for that. Instead of going after Hancock, Lee moved quickly to place himself in between Grant and Richmond. Frustrated at the fact that Lee had not taken the bait, Grant moved the Army of the Potomac still persistent east and south toward the capital. The two armies would meet at a place called Cold Harbor. The Confederates entrenched themselves in a nearly impregnable position. Hancock was on the far left of the Union line. Orders came down from Meade that three corps were to attack the Confederate position at 4.30 a.m. on June 3rd. Barlow and Gibbon's divisions were in the front line for the second corps, with Burney in reserve. The division slammed into the Confederate line. Gibbon's division could not make any headway and suffered dearly in front of the rebel guns. Barlow, on the other hand, did capture the enemy works, but could not hold on to it. As one soldier explained, they died in heaps. They got pushed back stubbornly, but only fell back about 40 yards to a small rise, where the men dug in with their hands and bayonets to make the position secure 
and fired into the Confederates from that short distance. After the immense bloodshed, the attacks were called off and the Union troops settled into their entrenchments. Hancock kept his headquarters extremely close to the front lines and while standing in the doorway of Winfield's tent, the assistant provost marshal, Captain Alexander McCune, was killed by a cannonball. The second corps commander was saddened by the loss and moved his headquarters the next day. His adjutant explained, however he might choose to deal with his own life, he recognized his responsibility for the lives of the young men he had called around him. Grant then pulled his army out of their fortifications and moved south. For a few days, Lee was baffled. He had no clear idea where Grant was or where he was going, but the Army of the Potomac was targeting Petersburg, Virginia, a vital railroad hub and the location where Lee got much of his supplies and communications from the rest of the South. What happened next was a series of miscommunications that led to the Union failing to achieve an important objective. Hancock's II Corps and Baldy Smith's 18th Corps, recently detached from the Army of the James, was to attack the weak defenses of Petersburg on June 15th. At least that was what Grant conveyed to Smith. However, that information was not given to Hancock. Winfield knew he was destined for Petersburg, but had no knowledge of an attack. On the night of the 14th, Meade sent word to Hancock to wait for the boats with rations to make it to his position. Hancock communicated to Meade that he did not need rations at the moment and could be in motion much earlier, but Meade insisted on the rations. Hancock waited from 3.30 a.m. to about 9 a.m. for the boats, but they never arrived. So he put his corps in motion at about 10.30 a.m. for Petersburg. The map that Meade gave to Hancock's aide was faulty, so it took Hancock until around 6.30 p.m. to get within a mile of Smith's forces. Smith, on the other hand, because of his extreme caution, had let a vital opportunity pass him by. He had well over 15,000 men at his disposal but without the Second Corps' help, and was in position to attack the entrenchments around Petersburg by 1.30 p.m. However, he delayed attacking until 7 o'clock. The enemy opposing him was commanded by PGT Beauregard and it consisted of about 2,800 men, mostly militia and citizens, prepared to protect the town. When Smith did attack, he captured part of the entrenchments and did not pursue any further. The Confederate forces were gone, and Petersburg stood ripe for the taking. By the time Hancock made it to the field, he did not know the situation, so he turned over the use of two of his divisions to Smith, but no further attacks were made, and Petersburg remained uncaptured. Smith badmouthed Hancock and most of the Union High Command in the press, and when an investigation was suggested to find out why the 2nd Corps commander had not arrived sooner or with more speed, Grant waved it off and said, The reputation of the 2nd Corps and its commander is so high, both with the public and in the Army, that an investigation could not add to it. That reputation cannot be tarnished by newspaper articles or scribblers. Hancock was mad at himself the next day when he found out that virtually no Confederates occupied the town the night before after the initial attacks. He was irritable and the incessant pain from his wound did not help. An officer found him at one point sitting on the ground pouring water into the still open wound, trying to get some relief. June 16th opened with 14,000 Confederates guarding Petersburg and for the next couple of days the Union Army attacked the fortifications, unable to dislodge them. It had been a month and a half since the campaign started, and the 2nd Corps and the entire Army of the Potomac was war completely out. Barlow relayed to Hancock that there were hardly any officers in his division because they had either been killed or wounded over the past month since the campaign began. On June 17th, Hancock reported to me that he could hardly walk or ride. The splintered bone from his wounding was working their way to the skin, and he laid in agony for 10 days, giving temporary command to General Burney. On June 22nd, the 2nd Corps met a disastrous fate as they attempted a flanking maneuver, but ultimately got flanked by men from A.P. Hill's Corps. The outrage from this disaster brought Hancock back into the field on June 27th. But what was to follow was the monotonous life of siege warfare as the Union position became stronger by the day so that more troops could be allocated to attack Lee's flanks. The stationary lifestyle would ultimately help Hancock as he still suffered from his wounding. The monotony of siege warfare not only impacted the rank and file soldiers, but also the general officers. When he was not in the field supervising drill or inspecting fortifications, he was lounging at his headquarters attempting to heal. One of General Meade's staff officers described the scene. 
Hancock lay at full length in a covered wagon, attired in a white shirt and blue flannel pantaloons, quite enough for the intensely hot day. He lies down as much as he can to give his wounded leg rest. On a regular basis, Meade would come to visit, sit down on the front seat of the wagon, light a cigar, and talk with Winfield. The staff officer said, We all knew he was fixed for an hour at least. When he gets down with Hancock, they talk and talk and talk, being great friends. In late June, Hancock and the 2nd Corps were to march across the James River at Deep Bottom. They did so encountering some lightly held Confederate positions and capturing four 20-pound Parrot guns. As they pressed on, Hancock came upon the well-entrenched men of Joseph Kershaw and Cadmus Wilcox. Seeing that the position was too strong to throw his troops against, he declined to attack it, but kept his eye on them. The whole time that the 2nd Corps was marching to Deep Bottom, some Pennsylvania miners were digging away at a tunnel underneath the Confederate line at Petersburg and planned to explode gunpowder and open a gap in the Rebel line. The Deep Bottom expedition was supposed to draw troops away from that sector so that when the explosion occurred, Union forces could rush in without the threat of Confederate reinforcements. It had worked. Lee had sent away three divisions to deal with Hancock at Deep Bottom, but the attack on the crater was hit with a lot of misfortunes and poor decisions and did not result in the desired hopes. The fact that the Deep Bottom expedition worked so well to drop troops away from Petersburg made Grant desire another movement to Deep Bottom that would accomplish many objectives. Reports informed Grant that Lee was planning on reinforcing Jubal early in the valley, so a movement to Deep Bottom may convince Lee to pull back those reinforcements, or if he did decide to send aid to Early, then his lines would be weakened. It seemed a win-win situation for the Union Army. The second expedition was much more complicated. Hancock's Corps was to get on transports and to sail off as if going to Washington. But during the night, they were supposed to steam back up the James River and disembark on gangplanks to the banks of the river. Hancock inspected the area personally and did not have faith in the gangplank idea, so he ordered wharves to be built. The expedition was fraught with mistakes. When the steamers went up the river, some boats ran aground and others found that they were taking on too much water and couldn't get to the wharves. When the Corps did disembark, it was much later than anticipated, but Hancock assaulted the fortifications as directed. However, Winfield ran into another problem, green troops. His ranks were replenished by brand new recruits who had never seen battle. Many refused to attack, or if they did, they did so lackadaisically. The Irish Brigade in particular crowded under a patch of trees and refused to move. It was horribly frustrating for the Corps commander, who had been so successful with his veterans, but now could not follow orders because his troops would not do as they were told. One happy event that did happen at the same time as the second Deep Bottom expedition, Hancock was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General in the regular army. After the debacle that was the second Deep Bottom expedition, Grant set his sights on a vital railroad the Weldon Railroad at Reams Station. On August 23rd, Hancock and his troops occupied the station and began destroying the railroad for about three miles to the south. The 6th Corps, which had been at the station back in June, had built some entrenchments, so on the night of the 23rd, the 2nd Corps occupied them. It was in the shape of a U and was not placed in the best location to fight off an attack. On the night of the 24th, Meade sent word to Hancock that a large body of enemy troops were moving in his direction. It was troops under Hancock's old friend Harry Heath, who was leading his men in that sector because A.P. Hill was sick. On August 25th, Heath's troops opened a grand artillery volley that scared the new recruits in the 2nd Corps. The cannonading only lasted 15 minutes before Hancock sent in four brigades. For a few minutes, Hancock's line held, but it quickly gave way. It looked to be a total disaster for the 2nd Corps. Two men stand out who saved the Union that day. One was Hancock, the other was his young division commander, Nelson Miles. Miles led what men he could find to repulse the rebels. Many got shot down in their attempt to retake the entrenchments. Hancock rode around the battlefield assembling groups of soldiers and leading them personally to the front lines, coming near being shot multiple times. The actions of Miles and Hancock were tireless, and they were able to keep the battle from being a total Union rout. It was getting dark and that brought the fight to an end. Hancock brought together his three division commanders and asked, if they attacked, could they retake the position? Miles and Greg said yes, but Gibbon said no, his men were not up to the task. Knowing that the assault would be pointless if all three divisions didn't act in a coordinated effort, Hancock ordered his men to fall back, leaving the field. Heath's men pulled back at the same time, 
but Hancock was sorely bitter for the situation. As his chief of staff said, it was the first time he had felt the bitterness of defeat during the war. This was the first big loss in Hancock's time as a corps commander. It was usually the second corps that held itself together during most battles, win or lose, but this was different. By October, Grant wanted another movement made to the southwest, this time at Hatcher's Run. He moved part of the 2nd Corps and the 9th Corps to that location. When the two Union Corps were supposed to attack, the 9th Corps held back and did not make their assault. Without a threat to the Confederate line, Harry Heath was able to concentrate his force against Hancock at Hatcher's Run. This time, when the two friends met on the battlefield, Hancock came out the victor. For the most part, Winfield's line held firm, and after the fight, he had to pull back because the rest of the Union forces had not supported him. Hancock had redeemed himself to himself for the debacle at Reams Station. That was the last of the major campaign and because winter was coming on. Throughout the summer and into September after the disaster of the crater, Ambrose Burnside was in a court of inquiry and Hancock presided over it. By the end, Burnside would be relieved of command. In late 1864, talk circulated around the Union Army that Meade was going to be given a separate command, possibly the army that was in the Shenandoah Valley, and it was Hancock that would become the commander of the Army of the Potomac. When Philip Sheridan took control of the Army in the Valley, instead of George Meade, the rumors of Hancock taking over the Army of the Potomac faded. However, Winfield would be taking another command, rather than remaining with his Second Corps. It was November 1864, and with the Union High Command not knowing exactly how long the war would last, they decided to form another corps, a veteran corps, made up of veterans who had served at least two years and were honorably discharged. They would be lured back into the army with a sign-on bonus of $500, and to make the situation more enticing, Hancock was chosen to lead it. Having a trusted commander at the helm of the corps would hopefully bring recruits streaming into its ranks. By the time December rolled around, Hancock had turned over his command of the 2nd Corps to General Humphreys and was now on the home front recruiting. He was having a hard time getting men to rejoin the ranks. Those who had survived two years in combat were not too willing to risk their lives again. Plus, depending on the locality from which these men enlisted, the sign-on bonus fluctuated, even though $400 would be coming from the federal government. Only a little over 4,400 men enlisted. On February 27, 1865, Hancock would be given command of the Department of West Virginia and the Middle Military Division, all of which encompassed Washington, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Its former commander, General George Crook, although a good fighter, had been captured by Confederate cavalry dressed as Union soldiers a few days before and taken to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. By this point in the war, there wasn't much for Hancock to do in that department. He sent cavalry against possible guerrilla attacks, but the war was coming to an end. In March, Grant sent him a message telling him to assemble his troops in the Shenandoah Valley and to be ready to move at a moment's notice. When Lee ultimately gave up Richmond, Grant wanted Hancock to proceed south to cut off Lee's army, but the order never came. Lee surrendered on April 9th, and with his capitulation, the other armies did as well through the spring and summer of 1865. When the war began, Hancock remarked to a friend that he expected to come out of the conflict a major. At its end, he was a major general, and one of the most respected soldiers in the United States. After Lee's surrender, Almira traveled from Baltimore to Winchester, Virginia to be with her husband, but although they hoped with the war to close to get some relief from the drudgery of military duties and spend time with each other, a catastrophe occurred. The president had been murdered, and the new president, Andrew Johnson, called on Hancock as commander of the Middle Military Division to restore order to the panic-stricken city and nation. Simply, Hancock's presence calmed down the city. Although much of the local law enforcement and military officials were already in the process of finding and rounding up participants in the murder of Lincoln and the attack on William Seward, his Secretary of State, Hancock helped to organize further manhunts. Once the conspirators were rounded up, Hancock oversaw many of the military matters related to the trial of the conspirators in the military court. At the end of June, Winfield accompanied William Seward to New York for the funeral of Seward's wife. He returned to Washington before the month was up and received the warrant of execution signed by Johnson. The date of execution was scheduled for July 7, 1865. On July 6, at noon, Hancock went to the arsenal where the prisoners were kept and delivered the warrants to the Special Provost Marshal General. He then visited each prisoner and delivered the news of their time for execution for the next day. 
When he informed Mary Surratt, the owner of the boarding house where the conspirators met to hatch their plan, she collapsed and said, I had no hand in the murder of the president. That night, Surratt's lawyers worked tirelessly to assemble a petition for a writ of habeas corpus to hopefully stop the execution of the woman. At 3 a.m. on July 7th, the writ was issued to Hancock to present the prisoner. When the court convened, Hancock was not present. The judge submitted that Hancock held military power over him, so he could do nothing to stop it. An hour and a half after the court convened, Hancock made his appearance, having been delayed by the military matters. His statement was in line with Winfield's adherence to military protocol. He informed the judge that Mary Surratt was in his possession, but he could not deliver her to court under a writ of habeas corpus because President Johnson had suspended the writ of habeas corpus in this case. The judge allowed him to leave and he reported back to the arsenal. Hancock was off-put by the thought of hanging a woman and hoping and possibly believing that the president would issue a pardon, posted couriers at intervals from the White House to the arsenal so that any word regarding the case could be sent to him as quickly as possible with no impediments. Later, Almira wrote that her husband advocated on Mary Surratt's behalf with the president, but because his wife was writing at a time when public opinion was against Surratt's execution and Hancock was receiving a partial blame for the injustice, Almira's statements are suspect. There is no evidence that demonstrates that Hancock ever advocated for her release to the president. John W. Clampett, Mary Surratt's attorney, approached Hancock and asked if there was any hope she would be set free. Despairingly, Hancock said no. He also told Clampett, I have been in many a battle and have seen death and mixed with it in disaster and in victory. I've been in a living hell of fire and shell and grape shot, and I'd sooner be there 10,000 times over than to give the order this day for the execution of that poor woman. But I am a soldier, sworn to obey, and obey I must. At 1.25 p.m. on July 7th, the four conspirators were hanged. Ten minutes later, the coroner pronounced them dead, but although Mary Surratt's time on this earth was over, her death and the events leading up to it would come back to haunt Hancock. After the controversial hanging of Mary Surratt, the Middle Military Division became the Middle Military Department, and Hancock had to move his headquarters to Baltimore, Maryland. For the rest of 1865 and into 1866, Hancock performed the duties he had become accustomed to before the war, garrison duty. He allocated troops, helped soothe unrest, and made trips to inspect garrisons. Almira made the journey to Baltimore and spent that time with her husband, making up for lost time that the war had taken away from them. One piece of business that Hancock took care of while the head of the department was obtaining a pardon from the Attorney General for his friend from California, Joseph Lancaster Brent, who had joined the Confederacy and obtained the rank of Brigadier General. Those high-ranking Confederate officials had to apply individually for pardons, and it was Hancock who lobbied on his friend's behalf. Another friend who made an appearance in Hancock's life was Harry Heath. The Virginian had to travel to Baltimore on business, and Winfield and Almira insisted that he stay with them. He did, and the two generals from the opposing sides of the conflict conversed with one another as if nothing had happened. They did some playful arguing about the Battle of Reams Station and Hatcher's Run, where they had commanded the two opposing sides and generally had a great time with one another. No war could dismantle their friendship. Before Heath left, Hancock informed him that he owed the ex-Confederate a thousand dollars. Heath, who had lost money while supporting the losing side in the conflict, thought this was a form of charity on Winfield's behalf. But the Pennsylvanian showed Heath in his ledger book that through their various business dealings in the 1850s, that he owed him $1,000. After the proof in black and white, Heath accepted the money. As the Union armies dissolved and the regular army emerged once again, Congress reorganized it to contain 54,000 men, a drastic increase from the 16,000 in the regular army before the war. However, there was more need for troops with the occupation of the South and to deal with Native Americans in the West. Therefore, basically two armies came into existence, one to deal with the South and one to deal with the West. William Tecumseh Sherman became the commander for the armies in the West, protecting white settlers who were traveling across the overland routes to the West Coast. Sherman wrote to Grant that he needed a young general who can travel and see with his own eyes, and if need be, command both whites and Indians to keep the peace, and he specifically mentioned Hancock as that commander, adding, Baltimore is no place for him. Also during this time, Grant got moved to general of the regular army, placing Sherman as lieutenant general and that left a space open for Major General in the regular army. There may have been some discussions, 
but there was only one choice most people agreed on, that Hancock should have that spot, and that is exactly what happened. In August, Hancock would take command of the military department of the Missouri, so he moved his family west to Fort Leavenworth. In late January of the next year, 1867, Hancock's father was ailing, and the family feared he was close to death, so Winfield obtained permission to go on leave to visit his father in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and arrived before he passed. On February 1, 1867, Benjamin Franklin Hancock passed away and was buried in Montgomery Cemetery. After the funeral, Hancock consoled his mother and then headed back to Fort Leavenworth for a proposed expedition to Kansas. Fear spread throughout the West that Native Americans were being heavily armed by white merchants and planned on uprising. Sherman and Hancock met at the former's headquarters in St. Louis to discuss the expedition. Sherman stated that he wanted Hancock to organize out of the present command a sufficient force to go among the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Kiowas, and other similar bands of Indians and notify them that if they want war, they can have it now. But if they decline the offer, then impress on them that they must stop their insolence and threats. Hancock assembled about 1,400 soldiers, elements of the 37th Infantry Regiment, the 7th Cavalry, and an artillery battery. On March 26, the force commanded by Hancock moved out from Fort Riley and headed deeper into Kansas. Colonel Andrew Jackson Smith commanded both the cavalry and the district through which the expedition moved, but while he did the paperwork, the cavalry work was done by his lieutenant colonel, George Armstrong Custer. Custer and Hancock had known one another since the Peninsula Campaign. On April 7th, the group made it to Fort Larne, a vital fort on the trail to New Mexico, and it was there that Hancock was to meet with some of the principal chiefs of the Southern Cheyennes. A snowstorm delayed the chiefs one day, then a passing buffalo herd, which they determined to hunt, delayed them again. It was the evening of April 12th before two chiefs, Tall Bull and White Horse, along with 10 or 12 braves, made it to Larne for the council. Hancock grew suspicious at the lateness and the meager attendance. Now I have a great many soldiers, Hancock said, more than all the tribes put together. I intend not only to visit you here, but my troops will remain among you to see that the peace and safety of the plains is preserved. Then he said, I have heard that a great many Indians want to fight. Very well, we are here. We came prepared for war. If you are for peace, you know the conditions. If you are for war, look out for its consequences. He emphasized the importance of keeping treaties made with us and letting the white man travel unmolested. I will await the end of this council to see whether you want war or peace. He also informed the two chiefs that he intended to march to their village to talk to more chiefs. Talbull replied with a dim outlook on their own situation because of the destruction of the bison and diminished numbers of their tribe. With that, the meeting ended. The next morning, April 13th, Hancock headed up the Pawnee Fork toward the village and camped about 20 miles from Fort Larned. That night, several Cheyenne chiefs and Pawnee Killer met with Hancock and arranged for a council to take place the next morning at 9 o'clock. The next morning came and no one came to meet with the general. At 9.30 a.m., Bull Bear, one of the Cheyenne chiefs, came into camp and informed him that the chiefs were on their way. Hancock did not like this lateness. He was a military man that prized punctuality, and this irked him. So he told Bull Bear that his force would march closer to the village and meet with them that night. The army had only made it a few miles before a large group of about 300 armed Native Americans came into view. They formed up into battle line, and so did Hancock's little army. They got to within a couple hundred yards of one another, and the tension grew. About 12 Indians rode toward the Blue Troops. Hancock, accompanied by Smith, Custer, and a few others, rode to meet them. Winfield asked if they wanted peace or war. The famous chief, Roman Nose, stated, We don't want war. If we did, we would not come so close to your big guns. When Hancock asked why he had not come to Fort Larned, he replied, My horses are poor, and every man that comes to me tell me a different story about your intentions. Hancock then informed the group that he would march closer to the village and meet with them that night. He did, and at about 5 p.m., several chiefs came to meet with Hancock. They told him that their women and children were scared and had already ran away. Winfield instructed the chiefs to bring the women and children back to the village. The chiefs left, and at 9.30 p.m., word was sent to Hancock that they had decided to flee with the women and children. Angry, Winfield told Custer to go surround the village, but when he made it to the encampment, all the Indians had already gone. All that was left was smoldering fires, empty lodges, and items not able to be carried. Hancock saw this as a disrespectful act, but not helping his case was that this was a peace-seeking mission. He ordered the village to be burned, 
and any goods found to be captured property. Word spread throughout the tribes of the fire on Pawnee Fork, and attacks began to increase against white settlers as an outcome. The army then moved to Fort Dodge, where Hancock met with Kiowa and Arapaho chiefs, having better conversations with them about peace than with the Cheyenne. He urged them to stay south of the Arkansas River in order to stay away from the hostile Cheyenne and Sioux, who were now attacking settlers. After leaving Fort Dodge, the group was met by the famed war chief Satanta. The chief assured Hancock that he wanted peace. As a gift, Hancock gave Satanta the overcoat, sash, and hat of a major general. Months later, Winfield was horrified to hear that Satanta led an attack on the herds of Fort Dodge wearing the regalia of a major general. Once Hancock returned to Leavenworth, he dealt with Native American uprisings by allocating troops to what was termed trouble areas, but the biggest problem he had was not with the Plains tribes, but with George Armstrong Custer. Hancock had dispatched the Cavalier across the Plains to deal with the hostile Indians, but Custer pushed his men to the breaking point. Forced marches and poor planning led to desertions, and Custer's orders to shoot deserters lowered morale further. Add on to that, a soldier began drinking heavily, presumably from the hard duty and committed suicide. This was already concerning, but to top it all off, Custer, without orders, leave, or authorization, abandoned his men at Fort Wallace and raced off to Fort Riley to see his wife. Hancock arrested and brought charges against him. Custer was found guilty and sentenced to one year suspension from the army. However, before the verdict was handed down and before the summer ended, on August 26, 1867, Hancock was transferred by order of President Andrew Johnson to command the 5th Military District, encompassing Louisiana and Texas. Louisiana, like many of the southern states, were having trouble adjusting to the abolishment of slavery and civil rights being given to African Americans. To make matters worse for them, they were being occupied militarily by Union troops. New Orleans had been a sore spot thus far during Reconstruction, and it had been commanded by Union generals like Benjamin Butler, Nathaniel Banks, and Philip Sheridan. Through a series of presidential orders and discussions between the President and Ulysses S. Grant, Sheridan and Hancock switched places. Sheridan went to command the Department of the Missouri, and Hancock traveled to New Orleans to oversee command of the 5th Military District encapsulating Louisiana and Texas. This was a huge transition from the radical Republicans supported Sheridan to the Democratic Hancock. When he received the order, he wrote, I am expected to exercise extreme military authority over those people. I shall disappoint them. I have not been educated to overthrow the civil authorities in time of peace. I intend to recognize the fact that the Civil War is at an end, and shall issue my order or proclamation accordingly. I tell you this because I may lose my commission, and I shall do so willingly, rather than retain it at the sacrifice of a lifelong principle. Hancock was not going to go along with radical reconstruction agendas, and this placed him in complete opposition to many of the people he was sent to oversee and members of Congress. He was thrust into the middle of the conflict between Andrew Johnson and the radical Republicans. Grant met with Hancock in Washington, D.C. before the latter moved on to New Orleans. After the interview, Grant was suspicious of Hancock and the actions he may take as commander of that district. Grant was right to be weary of Winfield's actions because they did not fit with how the commanding general wanted Reconstruction to proceed. Hancock had been instilled from his youth by his father that local and state governments should exercise their power freely with little to no intrusion by the federal government. It was this mindset that Hancock took with him into Louisiana and Texas, which put him on a collision course with Republicans in the state and in Congress. When he arrived in the Crescent City, he wasted no time in issuing General Orders No. 40 on November 29, 1867, his first day on the job, where he stated that where local civil authorities were ready and able to perform their duties, that the army would not interfere with those local governments, but that insurrection would be suppressed with a force of arms. This order caused a lot of concern all over the country and allowed white Democrats in Louisiana to breathe a sigh of relief. Republicans knew that without military might, then African Americans would fail to achieve any semblance of civil rights if the local governments had their way. But they also knew that they would be politically ruined without backup from the military, as they had in the past. In response to Hancock's order, some congressmen put forward a bill that would reduce the number of major generals by one, eliminating the junior officer, which was Hancock, but nothing came of the bill. Another action Hancock took was revoking an order put in place by Sheridan, 
which encouraged freedmen to be jurors and disqualified whites who formerly supported the Confederacy. Hancock argued that since so few African Americans could read or write, choosing them as jurors brought courts to a standstill. This also followed along with his mindset that the military had no right to interfere with civil matters if the civil authorities were prepared to take on those tasks. Without the military enforcing civil rights, local governments banned African Americans from being seated as jurors. A common occurrence in the Reconstruction South was the presence of soldiers at the polls to make sure no harassment or violence was perpetrated on any voter for their political beliefs. Hancock would recall all soldiers from standing guard at the polls, believing that the military had no right to interfere with elections. However, the lack of military led to voter suppression with violence and intimidation used as common tactics against political enemies. In early 1868, Hancock revoked another one of Sheridan's orders, the one preventing ex-Confederates from voting. Sheridan's proclamation had given a lot of political power to the newly freed African Americans, but Hancock's actions would inevitably change that. In February, another controversy would occur. In the election of 1866, Arthur Gastonell had won election as recorder of the second district of New Orleans. However, his defeated opponent took the winner to court because Gastonell was not of the legal age required to hold that position. By February 1868, he had attained that legal age, but the board and assistant board of aldermen met to elect a recorder. Hancock desired the people's choice to be installed and for no election to take place. The aldermen ignored Hancock's order and called for an election anyway. Winfield appointed Gastonell into the vacancy and removed nine aldermen. Seven of the nine were black and represented the entire black membership of the board. No African Americans were among the new members that Hancock appointed. Enough public outrage prompted Grant to order Hancock to reinstate the officials. Winfield performed his duty, then sent a letter the same day asking to be relieved of command of that district. On March 16th, he was granted his wish. Hancock returned to Washington from New Orleans and was named commander of the Division of the Atlantic. However, he would become estranged from Grant in light of Winfield's removal from command in Louisiana. While in Washington, D.C., Hancock went to talk with Grant, who was not in his office. Winfield was a little sore at Grant for countermanding his orders while commanding in Louisiana, and Grant did not like the direction Winfield took reconstruction in that state. That being said, a day or so later, Hancock walked by Grant on the street, who was talking with a former governor of Louisiana, and tipped his hat at the commanding general and passed by. Grant considered this a snub by a subordinate officer. The bad blood between the two began to boil. In 1868, the Republican and Democratic National Conventions met to pick candidates for the presidency. The Republicans chose Ulysses S. Grant. When the Democratic Party met in New York City, over the course of a couple of days, supporters for some of the most famous and notorious politicians upheld their candidate's superiority. At the convention was a band of supporters for General Hancock. He seemed like the best candidate to go up against Grant. The commanding general had saved the Union, produced victories, and was an all-around war hero. If the Democrats put up Hancock, they could nullify the Republican candidate because Winfield was also seen as a war hero. By the 18th ballot, Hancock had taken the lead, but after a recess, with the convention resuming the next morning, Horatio Seymour emerged as the presidential candidate from the state of New York. Hancock was passed over for the vice presidency because geographically, Pennsylvania was connected to New York, and they wanted to cast a wide geographical net. When Grant became commander-in-chief, he rearranged the commanders of the military divisions. He placed Meade back into the division of the Atlantic, Sheridan went back to Louisiana, and Hancock was sent to the military backwater that was the Department of Dakota. In a disrespectful move, Grant moved Sheridan to the rank of Lieutenant General when Sherman got advanced to the rank of General-in-Chief after Grant's resignation, rather than put George Meade in that position. When the position of Commander of the Division of the Pacific came open after the death of George Thomas, Hancock would ask for, but be denied that position in favor of a general his junior, John Schofield. The division of Dakota was a large expanse, 1,200 miles from east to west with only 1,682 soldiers. There were two posts in Minnesota with 155 men, 10 posts in Dakota with 1,121 altogether, and three posts in Montana encompassing 406 men total. It was a skeleton army that Hancock was expected to command. 
the general went on a 6,800 mile tour of the department. On July 2, 1869, he took a steamboat to Fort Stevenson in what is now North Dakota and met with several chiefs from the surrounding tribes aboard the ship. Because of his past problems and the way he dealt with Native Americans, he took on a new strategy and let his kindly nature govern his actions. The chiefs relayed to Hancock that they were starving and suffering from disease. Winfield did what he could by allocating food and medicine to the tribes. The chiefs later said he was a bright spot in their discussions with the army. One problem that Hancock was having in the department was Fort Buford. It was positioned in Lakota hunting territory and was coming under attack by that nation repeatedly. The army's horses and cattle would be stolen and it was causing a large headache to the commander. Through the Treaty of Fort Laramie, the army had given up its forts in the Powder River country and Hancock wanted to make sure that Fort Buford would not come to that same fate. Along with preserving the fort, he set about protecting the surveying parties of the North Pacific Railroad, protecting the mining settlements in Montana and securing the Indian agencies of the Missouri River. Many Native American groups had moved into Canada, so Hancock got permission to build a fort against the Canadian border with what is now North Dakota. Philip Sheridan desired a winter expedition against the Blackfoot Indians who had attacked miners in Montana. Hancock placed Major Eugene M. Baker in command of this expedition, and over the course of a month, from January 6th to February 6th, 1870, Baker marched 600 miles and had killed 173 Indians, 53 of which were women and children. Word spread throughout the country about what they termed the Baker Massacre. Sherman, Sheridan, and Hancock came to Baker's defense, regretting that women and children were accidentally killed, but insisted that such attacks came with such a possibility. Additionally, around 100 women and children were taken prisoner and then released. One of the largest tasks opposing Hancock was fulfilling the Treaty of Fort Laramie that allowed for the Sioux to keep the Black Hills in the southwest corner of the Dakota Territory. It became the duty of the army to prevent white encroachment into the area who attempted to capitalize on the gold present there. Hancock spent his years in the department turning back white settlers who wanted to mine in the Black Hills, and he was very effective at his job, gaining some respect from the Sioux for upholding the government's end of the treaty. Another significant moment that occurred while Hancock commanded the department was the expedition of Lieutenant Gustavus C. Doan of the 2nd Cavalry, who explored the upper reaches of the Yellowstone River. He made note of the geysers and deep canyons, and Doan's report was sent to Hancock. Then Hancock, intrigued at the report, sent it to the Adjutant General and recommended it to be published. This partially led to the establishment of Yellowstone National Park in 1872. In November 1872, George Meade passed away, and thus Hancock became the Senior Major General. According to custom, he could succeed Meade in his position at the time, which was the Division of the Atlantic. Grant did not have to give Hancock the position. He could have kept him in the Dakota Territory, but as Sherman advised him, it would give Sheridan a subordinate he would like to work with in the form of Alfred Terry. On November 25th, Hancock was named commander of the Division of the Atlantic, so he and his family packed up and began their journey east. While Hancock and his family was in transit to Philadelphia to the headquarters of the Military Division of the Atlantic, William Tecumseh Sherman changed the location of the headquarters to New York City. George Meade had been permitted to keep his headquarters in Philadelphia because it was his hometown, but since the old general had passed away, there was no need to keep it there, so the Hancocks had to change course. Winfield took command of the division on December 16, 1872. The division incorporated New England, the Mid-Atlantic States, and the Great Lakes region. The Great Lakes were commanded from Detroit by Meade's and now Hancock's subordinate Philip St. George Cook, the father-in-law of the famed Cavalier Jeb Stuart. The rest of the division fell under the direct supervision of the division commander. Hancock had been adept at army paperwork since before the war, and this was more of that very same thing, and he was good at it. This monotonous job, although important, produced a lackluster life, as opposed to the thrill of battle experienced in the war. However, the general did get to spend more time with his family. Unfortunately, in March 1875, at the age of 18, Ada, the Hancock's daughter, passed away. Winfield was grieved at this, especially since he had been so close to his daughter in the recent years. In 1876, the presidential election grabbed the attention of Hancock, who had supporters all over the country, putting his name forward as a possible candidate. For countless elections all over the country, Republicans waved what was called the bloody shirt. In short, that meant that they used the fact that they fought to preserve the Union 
and the Democratic side supported secession and the destruction of the country as a way to gain votes on the basis of being loyal to the United States. When Civil War veteran Rutherford B. Hayes was put up by the Republicans, the bloody shirt was waved and the only way for Democrats to get them to put the shirt away was to nominate a Union Civil War veteran as a candidate. Therefore, at the convention, Hancock's name was thrown into the ring, but Samuel Tilden of New York had secured the nomination long before the convention took place. On the second ballot, Tilden was declared the candidate. The election of 1876 was controversial, to put it lightly, but through political maneuverings and manipulation on both sides, Hayes was made president-elect. Calls were made to march on Washington and overthrow the election. Democrats even named Hancock as the man who could do it, but those that put forward that idea did not know Winfield Scott Hancock. The general himself was dedicated to the belief that the military should not interfere in civil life. Indeed, if something of that sort had happened, one can bet that Hancock would have been the one leading the charge against the insurrectionists. However, none of that materialized, and Hancock continued as division commander. Between 1876 and 1877, much of the South and the Gulf came under the command of Hancock, but with Hayes End in Reconstruction, the job of the Army changed through the eastern half of the country. The nation was embroiled in a hot labor dispute by 1877. The United States experienced a depression in 1873. Most workers were simply happy to keep their job, but four years later, as the country was rebounding, the railroad companies had began a rate war against one another. This led to companies slashing the pay of their workers to keep in competition with other railroads. However, although they cut the pay of workers, they still gave the customary 10% dividends to their stockholders. This infuriated the workers, and in 1877, we see the Great Railway Strike. Much of the focus was on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, where strike breakers were called in to replace those workers who refused to run the trains. However, in Martinsburg, West Virginia, the situation was a little different. The citizenry was behind the striking railroad workers. The police force was too small to control the protests, and even though they arrested some of the workers, a large crowd extricated them from the jail. Eventually, the large crowd blocked any train from moving, and around 1,200 freight cars were blocking the tracks at Martinsburg. The strike spread from West Virginia to Maryland, and then all over the country, but some of the most violent instances occurred in Pennsylvania, especially Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and towns between the two major cities. In Pittsburgh, militia had fired two volleys into a crowd and killed many. The angry mob trapped them in a railway yard, and troops only escaped by shooting their way out, losing some of their own. Hancock went to work traveling first to Baltimore and then to Philadelphia, spreading his troops all over the states of Pennsylvania and Maryland. The presence of regular troops quieted the riders, but there was still underlying tension. Hancock commented that the workers and their families were in bad situations and half-starved. However, for the moment, the strikes had been taken care of. The next crisis emerged in the coal district of Pennsylvania. Troops were sent to that part of the state, but Hancock became concerned because the political infighting between the President and Congress had prevented the soldiers from getting paid. Winfield ordered his troops to be encamped at a reasonable distance from the strikers to prevent them from joining forces against the corporations or the government under a common cause. The troops stayed at their posts until October 30th, and were finally recalled. Hancock did not like the idea of using the army in disputes between labor and corporations. He felt that that was a wrong way to use the army, and stated as much when he wrote to the adjutant general that the regular army should not be made a police force for the state. Despite his own distaste for the job he was doing, both politicians and citizens respected Hancock for performing his duties and making sure his soldiers did not act like the militia who caused more disturbances in the strikes. The general's biographer said it best when he wrote that, to emerge from such turmoil as the guardian of public order, clearly established Hancock as one of the most beloved of America's military leaders. Within his new position, Winfield Scott Hancock applied himself to military theory and attempted to revitalize the United States Army. The Hulkin forces of the Civil War had given way to a poor excuse for an army. Hancock set about doing a few things within his power to improve the armed forces. As one of Hancock's biographers stated, the common soldiers who made up the bulk of the force were volunteers, many foreign born, many illiterate, who signed up for a hitch of five years. A new recruit received little training before being sent off to a unit. A large proportion of the army's strength was on the frontier. 
A soldier on the plains spent his day escorting and protecting surveying parties, railroad workers, or traders, building structures for his post, occasionally fighting, and more often chasing Indians and combating idleness with cards and alcohol. Poor rations, inadequate housing, and bad treatment by officers compounded the unpleasant conditions, and desertion was common. For one, he supported the regimented practice of rifle instruction. Soldiers were poorly trained to use their weapons, and because there was little opportunity to actually use their rifles, the soldiers exhibited substandard marksmanship. Therefore, Hancock implemented rigorous rifle instruction and training. He even oversaw the instructions at his headquarters in New York. Eventually, he would become president of the National Rifle Association, which was having trouble obtaining members at this time. His prestige helped him keep it afloat. He took that position because he truly believed in the efficiency of knowing how to properly shoot a rifle. Two, he supported the establishment of military schools and training centers. He personally helped establish the Military Service Institution of the United States in September 1878. It was modeled after the British United Service Institution to focus on military science for aspiring officers. Furthermore, his foray into military theory led him to battle it out politically with Emory Upton, another Civil War general. Upton was a West Point graduate of 1861 and had won many accolades during the conflict. He put together the idea of a skeleton army, which was not unlike John C. Calhoun's idea for the army in 1820. Although Congress and the American people would not put up with having a large standing army, Upton wanted the army to possess the framework of a large organization. So if a conflict did break out, then the influx of recruits would fill in the gaps and flesh out the skeleton. Hancock had a different plan. He wanted the current army to be staffed at full strength, with each company having 100 men as designated. But to prevent Congress and the people from balking at that thought, only eight companies would be in each regiment. Also, he wanted the army to have less of a presence in the west along the frontier and more of a presence in the east along the coast building fortifications. That way, if war did break out, the country would have a readied force for combat and defenses capable of holding off an invasion. Hancock's plan would not increase the army size that much. It had been reduced to about 25,000 from the 50,000 right after the Civil War ended. The plan would simply fill out the army with able-bodied recruits, properly trained and educated. Senator Ambrose Burnside oversaw the committee which heard both Upton and Hancock's arguments, but the bill died in Congress. However, the country did, by default, adopt a similar theory to Upton's skeleton army plan. In 1880, Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency was coming to an end. Hayes admitted that he only wanted to serve one term, so both Republicans and Democrats dove into the political waters to emerge with a candidate. Many Republicans had turned their backs on Hayes, who they saw as not strong enough of a leader. He had pulled troops out of the South, ultimately ending Reconstruction, and he was lackluster when it came to civil service reform. Political arena was ready for Hancock to make his appearance as the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. He did have some opponents, namely Samuel Tilden, who had lost to Hayes in the controversial election of 1876. However, Hancock got a vital political ally in the two years before the convention. His name was Major Edward A. Burke. Burke was and continues to be an elusive character in history. His military rank was most likely self-bestowed. He claimed to be a Kentuckian, but most people pinned him as being from farther north. He was a master charlatan, and after arriving penniless in New Orleans in 1870, he worked as a day laborer at a stonecutter's yard, but before long he was a high executive in a small railroad. He used his power to become the political boss of Louisiana. We don't know exactly how Hancock came to know Burke, but it is suspected that he was introduced to the boss during his visits to New Orleans to visit the governor, who also used Burke's services. On a side note, Burke would be accused of stealing millions of dollars from the state treasury in 1889, but was never apprehended because he escaped to Honduras and lived a life of luxury the rest of his days. Nevertheless, Burke garnered all the political power he could in Louisiana to send off the delegates from that state to the Democratic Convention with Hancock's name as their primary choice. Burke did the same thing for Texas. One of Hancock's former fellow Corps commanders, Baldy Smith, helped secure the Vermont delegation, and Winfield's other supporters obtained support from other various states. It was looking good for the general. The Democratic Convention met in Cincinnati, Ohio in June 1880 to choose a presidential candidate. Tilden basically sent in a resignation letter informing the delegates that he did not seek nomination. On the first ballot, Hancock was ahead, and by the second ballot, 
Most delegations had given the general their votes. It was an amazing feat by Hancock's advocates. They had secured the votes needed and delivered rousing speeches that instilled a hope and faith that the savior of Gettysburg could win the presidency for the Democratic Party. It would not be easy for Hancock. He would be facing another Civil War general. The Republican convention chose James A. Garfield of Ohio, a dark horse candidate. This was shaping up to be an eventful election. Back at Governor's Island on the military base, Hancock got word of his nomination and the place flooded with well-wishers, including reporters wanting to know Hancock's thoughts. In a very humble way, he thanked everyone, but didn't make any lavish declarations. Reporters also went to William Sherman and asked him what he thought of Hancock's nomination. The leader of the March to the Sea stated that he didn't get involved in politics, but if you will sit down and write the best thing that can be put in language about General Hancock as an officer and a gentleman, I will sign it without hesitation. His nomination sent shockwaves through the Republican Party, who played it off as insignificant in the papers, but behind closed doors realized the gravity of the situation. President Hayes sent word to Garfield that the Democrats had made the best decision they could have made. Another Republican regretted that now the Southern issue and the bloody shirt would have to be put away in lieu of Hancock's nomination. Within his own party, his nomination was celebrated, but some didn't know whether he could pull off a victory. However, one of his former enemies in the Confederacy, but now a Democratic congressman, Joseph E. Johnston, wired Hancock and said, your nomination makes me much gladder than you. Throughout the rest of the year, Hancock welcomed guests in his headquarters, but one of the guests he most enjoyed was his old Mexican war buddy, Harry Heath. They talked of politics, and before leaving, Hancock told Heath, I have made it a rule by which I shall be governed to make no promises. Hancock told of a general in his old corps who wanted to be an ambassador. I will not do it, for I do not think he would fill credibly the position he asks, and I am determined to appoint no man to office that I do not believe qualified to fill it. I have told you that I have intended to look out for you and I shall do so. Heath relayed to his friend that he sought no appointment, but he did seek another promise. The promise I wish you to make me is something personal to yourself. When you become President of the United States, you will have a great deal of entertaining to do. You will have to entertain crowned heads, possibly, the justices of the Supreme Court, senators, and distinguished people. I want you to promise me at these functions not to mash your potatoes. Hancock roared back, to the devil with you and your potatoes. On July 13, 1880, heads of the Democratic Party went to Governor's Island to perform the notification ceremony for Hancock's nomination. The general was distracted to say the least. His son Russell had been visiting for over a month from Mississippi, but Russell's son, Hancock's grandson, named after the general, after a long bout with an illness since being in the New York, passed away at 6 o'clock that morning. There was little time for mourning. Hancock was still the commander of the military division of the Atlantic, and now a presidential candidate. There were not enough hours in the day to take care of all matters, and he did not want to ask for leave to run his campaign, so he limited political visits to three hours, three days a week, which irritated many potential visitors. One of his old comrades in blue went to visit him during one of these visitation hours. Finding him surrounded by people, he asked, General, how do you find this thing? Hancock replied, Don't find it at all. There is nothing congenial about this thing. These miserable devils worry me to death. They come here from all parts of the country, even from Arkansas and Texas, to tell me how many votes they can command. Worst of all, they want to expect pledges that I will give them offices for their services. Did you ever see such a hungry crowd? Hungry, hungry, hungry. He sighed and said it was worse than Gettysburg. They take me in front and rear, they outflank me, and worst of all, they cut off my retreat. The locusts of old are as nothing to them. Although Republican newspapers skirted the issue of his military career, some did attack him, but the attacks fell short because most people knew his record and wouldn't believe the false reports. What they did assault him with was his lack of a political career. Inexperience was what newspapers threw at the general as insults, but the only statement that hurt him was one from his former commander, Ulysses S. Grant. In a private discussion, Reverend Fowler recorded what Grant had to say about Hancock. The former president called him ambitious, vain, and weak and ever since his name had been put up for nomination in the past, that he had been consumed with the thought of being president. Grant even claimed that Hancock had allowed Louisiana politicians to steal $7 million from the state by appointing corrupt officers. When the story was published, Grant regretted the statements because he thought the conversation was private and wouldn't go public. The accusations about Louisiana had been false and retracted by newspapers, but the damage had been done. 
The subject of Mary Surratt's execution came back to haunt Hancock, but not for long. People were horrified about what happened to her, feeling her punishment unjust. But when her lawyer came out publicly and settled the matter by saying Hancock did all he could to spare the woman's life, the matter was settled. Other statements were run by Democratic newspapers, like the glowing comments by Sherman and even Sheridan were quoted about Hancock. He said, I am not in politics, but General Hancock is a great and good man. Democrats hurled attacks at Garfield for the financial and political scandals he had been involved in as a congressman, but ultimately neither man was completely sunk by these insults or critiques. Hancock was a war hero, and Garfield had been a loyal Union general and a congressman who had made friends in Washington, D.C. It was seemingly evenly matched in many regards. As the election neared, three significant moments hurt Hancock's political aspirations. First, Hancock granted an interview with a reporter who he knew would ask about one of the most contested issues of the election, the tariff. Republicans had supported a protective tariff to protect American businesses and goods from being undercut by foreign products. Democratic candidates were against tariffs in some localities and for it in others. As a party platform, they were for the reduction but not complete abolishment of tariffs. Republicans claimed that the Democrats wanted free trade, which would hurt Americans. So the Democrats needed to defend themselves against this critique. Hancock granted the interview to put that issue to rest. In the discussion, he was vague, but basically said that he would support a tariff to protect the American people. However, he described the tariffs as a local question. To 19th century Americans, this lack of political vocabulary signaled that Hancock was not a politician, and Republicans used this description of tariffs to convince Americans that Hancock was unfit for the job of president. Although not schooled in political rhetoric, Hancock knew what he meant by the term local question. He meant that the tariffs was a geographically dependent question for voters to consider when electing congressmen and senators, but that is not how many took it. Although not Hancock's actions, the mayoral race in New York City became a bone of contention when Democrats put up a Catholic as a mayoral candidate. That very act scared New Yorkers into thinking that the Democratic Party would allow the Pope to run the United States and that state funds would go to support Catholic churches and schools. Thirdly, and possibly one of the most detrimental actions, was the publishing of a letter that was allegedly from the desk of James A. Garfield, Hancock's opponent, to a labor union which basically stated that he supported the importation of Chinese laborers to work on farms and in factories in the United States. The letter was a complete hoax, and even the labor union which it was addressed to was fictitious. The Democratic Party had supported its publishing, known as the Maury Letter, the portrayal of the party as intentionally deceitful, despite Hancock and many of the Democratic politicians having nothing to do with it, hurt the campaign significantly. On November 2, 1880, the election was underway. The South went solidly for Hancock, as expected, but now he needed to secure some Midwestern states and New York. He secured New Jersey, and he still had a lead in New York when at 9.30 p.m., Hancock stood up at his headquarters and said, The results so far are very encouraging and I hope they will continue to be so, but I am willing to wait till morning, and meantime, get a good night's sleep. I don't care to see any further dispatches or be waked. He then went to bed. During the night, he lost New York, the state he needed to win in order to obtain the presidency. Garfield stayed up late and knew the decision by 3 a.m. Hancock woke up at 5 a.m. and asked Almira what the news was. She said, it has been a complete Waterloo for you. Hancock stated, that is all right, I can stand it, then rolled over and went back to sleep. He had lost his home state of Pennsylvania and his home county of Montgomery by one vote. The electoral vote count stood 214 for Garfield and 155 for Hancock, 185 to win. The 35 electoral votes in New York could have swung the balance the other way for Hancock and the Democrats. There had been some missteps and bad political decisions, but he had lost, albeit with a great showing only losing the popular vote by 7,018 votes out of more than 9 million votes cast. Although there was talk of fraud specifically in New York, Hancock stated that whether it had been taken from him by other means or if the people had voted against him, he wouldn't change the results. He had been sickened by the political aspirants and charlatans that descended upon him since the nomination, and he left any thought of political office behind him. He even attended Garfield's inauguration, stating, I have no right to any personal feeling in the matter. It is clearly my duty as a soldier to obey. A Democratic Congress has formally announced that the people have duly elected James A. Garfield. 
it certainly seems that a Democratic candidate should be there to support the assertion. Thomas Nass poetically created a cartoon after the election depicting Hancock sitting next to a fire with his head bowed while the spirit of liberty places her hand on his shoulder, saying, No change is necessary, General Hancock. We are too well satisfied with your brave record as a Union soldier. Following the defeat in the presidential election of 1880, Hancock was hit with more grief in his own personal life. His chief of staff, General William G. Mitchell, who he had known and been friends with since the Battle of Williamsburg, passed away in May 1883. His mother-in-law, who lived with Almira and Winfield, died the month before, and in December of 1884, his son Russell died at the age of 34 in Mississippi after a brief illness. Ada's death was not far from his mind either, since she had passed, he had been very busy fulfilling her last wish that she not be buried in the ground, so he designed a vault and the construction was oversaw by his lawyer friend from Norristown, Pennsylvania, B.E. Chain. Hancock designed it to be big enough to later rest Ada and himself. Almira wanted to be buried with her family in St. Louis, and no amount of pleading from his wife could convince him not to be buried in Norristown with Ada, the location of his boyhood. Chain not only helped him with the vault, but when Hancock needed financial help, Chain loaned him the money. Winfield always insisted on paying back the money with interest, and he never failed to make a payment to his friend. One reason that money became an issue for the general was that he had to give money to his twin brother Hillary, whose law practice in Minneapolis suffered from Hillary's alcohol addiction. In 1881, he planned the celebrations for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown. Hancock entertained guests at a luncheon aboard the ship, the St. John, where President Chester A. Arthur was in attendance. In 1882, he, along with John M. Schofield and many other senior officers, supported a measure to be sent before Congress that would fix the retirement age for Army officers. It was an unselfish sacrifice to know that by supporting this measure, that he would most likely not obtain command of the whole Army. Hancock's last major public appearance was in 1885, when he organized and coordinated the funeral procession and ceremony for Ulysses S. Grant. On August 8th, he sat astride a large black horse and led the funeral procession for the former president and army commander to the tomb, followed by numerous politicians and former commanders, both north and south. In November of that same year, Hancock traveled to Gettysburg for the first time in 20 years, where he walked over the battlefield answering questions and setting the record straight about troop placement and facts about the battle. He generally had a wonderful time reliving one of his greatest triumphs. Just a few months later, in January 1886, he traveled to Washington, D.C. for business, but he was aggravated by a boil that had popped up on the back of his neck. A doctor had lanced it, but it was growing in size and causing the general great discomfort. He left for Governor's Island earlier than planned. When he got home, his personal physician came to look at the boil and help Hancock back on his feet. His condition grew worse as the boil grew larger, causing him to not be able to move his head without great pain. Over the next few days, he would appear to be getting better only to have a setback the next day. On the morning of February 9th, another doctor was called in after the general became so weak that he could barely speak, and an examination of his urine concluded that he was suffering from diabetes, which was exacerbating his problems. At 2.55 p.m., Hancock drew a long breath. His body quivered slightly, and then he lay still. The savior of Gettysburg was dead. Almira was left with very little. The homes they had lived in were military quarters, so when her husband passed, she was left without much in this world. Political allies and others rallied to her support by raising around $55,000 and procuring her a house in Washington, D.C. She would pass away in 1893. Monuments were erected all over the country honoring the great general. His reputation as a superb soldier endeared him to all Americans and he would go down as one of the country's best military leaders. Former President Rutherford B. Hayes, despite being on the opposite end of the political spectrum, wrote the following a few days after Hancock's death. If, when we make up our estimate of a public man, conspicuous both as a soldier and in civil life, we are to think first and chiefly of his manhood, his integrity, his purity, his singleness of purpose, and his unselfish devotion to duty, we can say truthfully of Hancock that he was through and through pure gold. When the statue of Hancock was unveiled at Gettysburg, 
Henry H. Bingham, a member of Winfield's staff, said, One felt safe when near him.